Uh, good morning. Let's see, are we looking like we have a quorum here yet? We do have a quorum now. Excellent. Well, we will go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, let's go ahead and start with a roll call. Hey, Caroline Traub. Here. Nancy Bernard. Valerie Graber. Here. Tom Jensen. Jonathan Jones. Here. Megan Kramer. Chris McCarthy. Here. Mark Rabel. Andrea Smith. Here. Brandon Stock. I'm here. Good morning. Jeff Yurick. Do you want butter and cinnamon on your? And it looks like Nancy just joined us. Yes, thank you. Great. Would anyone from the public like to introduce themselves? Sure, I'll go first. This is Terry Beals representing Sound Transit. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Walker from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I'm going to give a, a brief presentation in a few minutes. Welcome, Ian. Johnny Kocher here, representing the ventilation proposal. Mark can't be here today. Welcome, Johnny. Craig Holt here. I'm a new member of the council and just listening in to see how things work. Welcome, Craig. All right. Thanks, everyone. So next up oh, to oh. Kevin Duhall, Northwest Natural. Didn't realize we're doing check-in. Morning, Kevin. Thanks for joining. All right, so next up is to review and approve the agenda. Would anyone like to make a motion to amend or approve the agenda as shown? If not, I'll move approval. Thanks, Nancy. Is there a second? I'll second that. This is Jonathan. Jonathan, uh, any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. All righty, um, so the next item on the agenda is to review and approve the meeting minutes from last week's May 19th mechanical tag meeting. So those minutes are in front of you. They're also posted on the website with the other meeting materials for today. So hopefully everyone had a few minutes to take a look at those. So with that, uh, yeah, looking for a motion to approve or amend the meeting minutes from May 19th. Move to approve. Thanks, Brendan. Second. Thanks, Valerie. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay, motion carries. So um, just a quick recap of where we are here. So we received a total of 17 proposals for the mechanical code, the fuel gas code, and the mechanical sections of the residential code. Um, one of those was just a minor editorial item. So it's really 16 proposals. And over the past two TAG meetings, we have discussed all 16 proposals and we have moved forward <clears throat> either as submitted or as modified seven of them. So we have nine remaining proposals to address. Those are in front of you on the agenda. And in general, um, 
these nine proposals were returned to proponents to address uh, questions or comments from the TAG and from members of the public that were raised um, in kind of the first pass of them. So for those remaining nine proposals, we have received revisions for several of them, and those are posted with today's meeting materials. Um, we do have another meeting scheduled for next Thursday, June 2nd from 9 to 12 to revisit any proposals from today. Please plan on sending any revised versions to Krista by end of day Tuesday, May 31st at the latest, so the TAG has time to review those before the next um, and possibly final meeting. Um, just as a reminder, the TAG has great flexibility in how proposals are addressed, so you can move to approve them as submitted, you can move to approve them as modified, you can move to disapprove them, you can move to table them if you feel additional offline work is required or so that you have more time to consider them before voting on them. Um, as a, a final reminder, any proposals that are moved forward by the TAG will go to the MVE committee, likely sometime the week of June 13th, and then to the council for the June 17th meeting. So if you discover any editorial items or tweaks to anything that has already moved forward, please reach out. We could address those items at the MVE meeting. After that meeting, um, all these proposals will be available for public comment over the summer prior to further council action in the fall. So for today, I'm hoping the proponent can kind of reintroduce the proposal to refresh us on all its, um, on its purpose and then highlight what concerns or questions were raised last time. And then lastly, focus on how you changed the proposal um, to address those issues. So any questions about process um, before we dive in? Uh, Nancy. Um, yeah, can all the stuff you just said, Carolyn, where can I find that in writing? Because um, there's a number of proposals my agency has interest in, and I need to inform other people of this process. Yeah, I think um, the recordings from all of these meetings are posted on the website. And I think I've generally said that same spiel most times, but you could definitely refer them to the recording or always feel free to reach out to me or Krista and I'm happy to explain the process again. Well, I assume there is some document on the website. Maybe Krista can can um, point me to it later that I can point people to. With yeah, the, or Nancy, I can provide you with the link to the policies and procedures and bylaws. Thank you. I get lost on the website. Great question. Thanks, Nancy. Any other questions or comments on process before we dive in here? All righty. Well, we are starting today with Proposal 63, and I believe we have multiple guest speakers who wish to share some additional information with the TAG, which is great. Really appreciate their time and expertise. Um, I think one of the speakers might have a little bit of a tighter schedule and is only available till 930. Um, so Kevin, your speaker might be available till 10. So I just wanted to check if it was all right if Ian went first, Kevin, and then your speaker followed. Does that work for you? Sorry, muted. Uh, I believe Randy is on the call. He can speak to that. He might be muted. <laughs> okay, I think I'm unmuted. Till one o'clock is fine for me. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Randy. Appreciate that flexibility. One o'clock being 10 o'clock our time. Okay. Yes, correct. Thanks. And just, Chris, just for your knowledge, what you have up on the screen is not the latest version, and I apologize for not sending it to you, but I'm not going to be, I'll be sending it out to folks who are interested, but we're not going to be reviewing the language this morning unless folks have specific questions. It's more going to be about the science behind the proposal. Okay. So with that, I guess, Johnny, it sounds like you are representing Mark's proposal here today. So yeah. I'll turn it over to you. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, I worked with a lot of folks to refine the language a little further. Um, I think we're much closer to getting the finalized language uh, a lot. There's a lot of interactions, other pieces of the code that I'm still kind of working through. And uh, anybody is interested in continuing to work on that with me, um, I'll be sending, I can paste a link to the 
most recent proposal in the chat. Um, but I'd like to turn over to Ian Walker with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, who's been kind enough to come here today and present on the research that's behind the proposal and like why we are requiring these specific um, the specific code. Um, and and uh, thank you, Ian, for making time. I know you're very busy. No problem. Th thanks, Johnny. Um, yeah, I think I'll, if I may, I'm going. Is it possible to uh, share my screen so I can share some slides with you all? I'm happy to talk, but it'll just be easier with the slides, as pictures and stuff. All right, thank you. Okay. So um, I wanted to just give sort of a quick sort of 10 or 15 minute background to, uh, you know, what, why we're thinking about changing requirements for kitchen uh, ventilation. And I think I'll start out by saying things that you probably all know, that we get contaminants in the air from both cooking the food and the heat sources. But the, 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 the key thing here is the reason why we differ, are differentiating between gas and electric cooking a lot these days is the specific contaminants that only come from burning methane. And they're predominantly uh, NO2, carbon monoxide and various aldehydes. Things like particles and odors come from food and electric cooking also turns particles, but there are these specific contaminants of concern. And, and the, a good question is, you know, why are we concerned about it? Well, this is a, a chart with a lot of info on it, but basically we use a, a, a something called disability adjusted life year when we're trying to convert from, if there's a contaminant in a space, what's the impact on your health? A bigger number is worse, you're more disabled. In other words, and we've looked at lots of contaminants in homes and ones that pop out as being um, really significant that are associated with cooking are highlighted in this chart here. And they are particles sometimes referred to as PM 2.5. 2.5 refers to the fact that this is particles smaller than two and a half microns in size. You can't see them. They're very tiny. And NO2, again, which is something you can't see. It's, it's a gas that we, uh, you get from burning methane. And because a primary source of these contaminants has been identified as being from cooking in homes, that, that's why there's a whole bunch of work done over the last um, decade or so looking at kitchen ventilation. Uh, there are well-established connections between children's health and gas cooking. I've got a big bibliography on this I'm happy to share with you all. Primarily, this is from the NO2 from combustion. There's also well-established connections between PM 2.5 and health. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of studies on this. These are well-established health impacts on people. And the World Health Organization, the US EPA and so on, they therefore give limits for these contaminants. And I, I give a couple of examples here, which, will, which I'll get to in a moment. And, and some of the, the sort of the key question that me and my fellow researchers have been working on is, what do we do to ventilate kitchens to keep these contaminants below health thresholds? And we start out by actually going to people's homes and measuring them. We put little monitors that when people are cooking, we measure things like range hood operation. We have all these different indoor air quality sensors to measure the particles, the NO2. We also look at carbon dioxide, humidity, a whole bunch of other stuff. And when we go into people's homes to do some measurements, um, we often use scripted cooking events so that we're doing the same thing in every single home. And when we plot up our results, what we find is that quite often we exceed these health guidelines. Um, in a recent study in California, almost half the homes exceeded those NL2 World Health Organization guidelines on a regular basis. Basically, every time you cooked, there was a problem. The, another question is, okay, so you expose a cook, are you exposing the other people in a home? Because from a public health point of view, we want to know, is it everyone who gets exposed? The answer is, Everybody gets exposed. This is a little plot that's just comparing if we measure, say, NO2 in the kitchen and NO2 in a bedroom, how much lower is it? It's about 20% lower in bedrooms. In other words, when you have these gases contaminants, they get everywhere in a house, everybody gets exposed. The next question is, um, are there some people who are more impacted than others? And the answer is yes. If you live in an apartment or a smaller home, you've got less volume into which contaminants come, and so you get higher concentrations. And when we look at um, particularly uh, apartments, which in this particular study were low-income apartments, but apartments in general are associated with lower income, um, we find that people cook at home more, which results in more exposure, and they're cooking in smaller homes, which 
converts into a bigger health risk. So if we're interested in helping out low income and disadvantaged communities, this is a critical health impact for them because our contaminants are always going to be higher in apartments and houses. And one of the things that has had a big push recently, independent of setting building codes and standards, is for public health organizations to look at using electric cooking instead of gas cooking, um, particularly for uh, looking at uh, asthmatic children. So that's sort of a bit of the health background. And now I'm going to go in a little bit more about where some of the specifics of this kitchen vented proposal come from and, and what's behind them. We assume the homes get ventilated, which is kind of conservative in the sense that many homes don't have an ASHRAE 622 ventilation system in them. In new construction um, in Washington state, this happens, but most existing homes don't have this. Um, we get, we're going to assume that we get the same particle emissions for gas and liquid cooking. There are differences, but they're kind of going to be a minor effect. The, the key thing is the extra NO2 from gas that is uh, critical here. And we got the emission rates from various, uh, I showed you some field studies from going to people's homes. We also did tests in laboratories to do very, very controlled tests. And we also look at, the, at how kitchen ventilation systems perform, particularly we talk about range hoods and we have a thing called CE or capture efficiency, which is how well your range hood actually works. And what capture efficiency is about is if you emit something from the cooktop, what fraction gets sucked into your hood and thrown away and goes outside, which is ideally what we would like. We call that fraction capture efficiency. There's been an ASTM test method around for about five years or so. It started development back in about 2013. It involved a whole bunch of appliance manufacturers, indoor air quality experts, people who know about measurement. And it's in an ongoing revision process, uh, even as we speak. Um, the laboratory testing meant that we could set up some very, very specific cooking. And these are just some Nice pictures. So we have little on the right there, we have standardized emission elements. On the left, we actually with frying beans, as my colleague Woody Delp there doing the hard work. Um, and we use the same approach as we used in the infield testing. This is actually my kitchen with Woody testing it, measuring airflows and so on. And if we if we get all these data about how well these range works, we get these relationships between capture efficiency and airflow, which you will have seen in some of the proposals here when we're looking at how to improve kitchen ventilation, we often specify both an airflow and a capture efficiency, and they come from these relationships here. And um, basically this comes from testing a whole bunch of range search in various uh, situations. You'll notice here, just so, sort of for fun, if you're interested in reducing contaminants in your own home, if you cook on the back burners and turn your range hood on, it always performs better than on the front burners. Um, so if you want a little takeaway for your own home, do that. Um, the other thing to note is there's a little vertical blue line at 100 CFM because that's what's currently in the US standards. The ASHRAE 622 standard specifies as minimum airflow. And you can see the capture efficiency is not awesome at that low in airflow, which is why a lot of the new specifications in California have been proposed in Washington are proposing higher airflows because we need those higher airflows to get to higher capture efficiency. If we now look at specifically trying to measure some contaminants, uh, this is our test lab at LBL. Um, you can see the cooker in the background there. There's a, a range hood mounted against the wall. We have some fake kitchen cabinets and a whole bunch of wires and boxes that are doing all the measurement uh, for us. And what we've done in this test lab is a whole bunch of what we call scripted cooking, where we cook the same meals over and over again. And I'll just use one example here. We had several different meals. A key one was a scripted breakfast meal where we did things that we cooked bacon, eggs, and hash browns in a very, very specific way so it was repeatable. And you can see here, this is the script that the people doing the cooking had to follow. And I will tell you, we ate all the food that we cooked. It was not thrown away. It got eaten by things like starving graduate students and postdocs, and occasionally by people like myself who needed a snack. We did not throw any of the food away. We ate it all. But if we look at the emissions that come off these cooking processes, this is the sort of thing that we find. This is the concentration of NOx, particle number on PM 2.5, um, evolving with time during the cooking of the breakfast. And you can see that we did this several times. There's, there's three black lines there because we did it three times. The dashed lines are what happens if you turn on a really, really super duper range hood. And what you find is if you use a super duper range hood, it does exactly what you expect. And it really, really reduces the concentrations a lot. 
But the thing to look at is what if you don't have a range hood or you don't use it or you don't have a super duper range hood? What sort of concentrations do we get? And you can see here that I, I put horizontal blue lines in there, that are those health standards. And we see that when we uh, burn gas, we definitely exceed those NO2 one hour thresholds regularly. Even though there's some variability between each trial, we always are, are exceeding that threshold. And it's even worse for the particle threshold, as you can see in the figure below. And so this was cooking with gas. If we use an induction cooker, again, doing exactly the same meal, we see that not surprisingly, we don't see any NOx because we're not doing any combustion. That's kind of obvious. We also see about a halving in the particle concentration. And there's a lot more variability there. And when you're doing a lot of frying like we're doing here, even if the source of fuel is clean, you can still exceed the particle concentrations. Even though it's higher with the gas, you're still gonna exceed these uh, minimums uh, when you're doing a lot of frying. And so we did a bunch of modeling to figure out if you get these emission rates and put them in homes of different sizes, what sort of capture efficiency and airflow would you need for the, for the range hood if you wanted to make sure that you didn't exceed the 24 hour PM2.5 limit or the one hour NO2 limit. And that's where this table comes from that's been proposed the state of California. And the, the critical difference between the gas and electricity is that uh, with the gas, you get NO2, the electricity you don't. The, NA2, the NO2 gets critical um, higher. So we need better capture efficiency and or more airflow. The reason why this size scales with floor area is that the quantity that gets emitted is the same for different sized rooms or dwellings, but the concentrations you get are gonna be lower in a bigger space. And so we see this variability with um, size. So if you're looking at small apartments, you need to have better capture efficiency or higher airflow. If you're living in a very large home, um, you can have a slightly lower capture efficiency and airflow for the same uh, for the same exposure. And um, I'll I'll stop there. Um, I went through this very quickly, so I'm assuming there's going to be some um, some comments. I'm happy to share these slides, by the way. And uh, just so you know, um, I've got some references and a whole bibliography here that if you want some background information or do more reading, again, I'm, I'm happy to share these slides to share this with you. And um, there are some other ideas that have been kicked around that I think may be tangential to the discussion today, but just so you know that these are discussions that are happening between researchers and industry and practitioners is um, without automation, without a range of turning on, there's some big issues with NO2 in apartments. And there's several studies right now that are about to start in California, looking more into childhood health and cooking with gas, particularly related to asthma and uh, looking at methane leakage uh, from gas cookers also. Um, and we should also know that in other countries, they've already completely automated this. Um, there are usage sensors that automatically turn on your kitchen ventilation in countries like Japan that are almost universal. They introduce them for safety reasons. Um, if you have like a pot of hot oil or something, they were looking at reducing fires, but it turns out that automating the ventilation system using those controls also is good from an indirect quality point of view. But I think these are issues that are sort of beyond discussion today, but you should know that there are other things regarding kitchen ventilation that people are talking about. So like I said, I will um, stop there and hope if you have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, it looks like we have one hand up. Uh, Randy, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Randy. Yes, hey, Ian, this is Randy Cooper. I didn't realize you were gonna be on the call as well. So um, the only thing that I was going to say is because we're pro ventilation and to what you said, we're you know, working on automatic range hoods and, and all mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. The only thing that I saw is the work we're doing in ASHRAE 62.2, you know, it, it's not quite ready yet. And we're working towards that. So that the question is, we want to put requirements in that may change because we, we're still working through the repeatability of ASTM E3087. Um, we're going to be coming out with nominal installed airflow later this year, which, which is likely to change those numbers that LBNL saw on airflow because of that. And so I'm, I was just saying that we're pro ventilation. We, we think that should be going. It's just that 
I think ASHRAE 622 would be the better reference in the future rather than copying what California has done at this point. Yeah, thanks, Ray. I think you're right. Well, the, the 622 process um, tends to be slow. And I think that uh, California in particular, they, they didn't want to wait for the 622 process. But I, I agree with you. I think eventually the ASHRAE ventilation standard, the national ventilation standard will catch up with all of this and it will have its own requirements, at which point I think a lot of jurisdictions will probably just adopt those changes when they come around. I think that's, a, I think that's almost certainly how the way this will go. Great, thanks. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, great to see you, Ian. This is uh, fascinating stuff. I uh, got a few quick questions for you. One, yeah. you, you had a slide that mentioned that electric ranges were not NO2 free. And I'm looking at a paper that I think defined these airflow rates. It's uh, Singer et al. Uh, effective kind of kitchen ventilation, et cetera. Yeah. And he, he mentions that um, electric coil burners can also emit NO2, but obviously rates much lower than a gas burner. Just a... Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're so low, they're almost impossible to measure. Okay, that, that's good perspective. Yeah. Uh, but then, Brett, Brett is a true academic. He will never say something is truly zero unless it is absolutely zero. But oh, I appreciate that clarification. The, the, the NO2 comes from uh, some room chemistry and things like that, where, sure. where it's a very, very small amount. But the, the NO2 from burning uh, gas is a, is a well-known thing. I think you, some of you probably know that uh, burner designs and things like uh, water heaters and furnaces um, have been continually developed over the years specifically to reduce uh, NO2 emissions. It's a, it started out actually from an outdoor air quality uh, issue uh, because NO2 is, uh, is a photo, photoreactor, it creates smog. And back in the 70s, California started down this route of low NO2 uh, emissions from burners for things like water heaters. Uh, but those products have been around for a long time, low NO2 uh, water heaters, for example. Cool. Uh, uh, the other question I had was, you had a slide up that showed the impacts to health. I forget the proper title. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that the PM 2.5 was like a factor of 1,000, mm -hmm. and nitrous yeah. oxide was about 1, you know, 10 to the yeah. 0. Was, are those relative impacts factored into the model? Or how, how um, yeah, so, the, so those impacts are population-wide impacts rather than for an individual household doing an individual activity. So PM has many other sources. Sure. Right. Uh, it's still mostly combustion, frankly, but sure. most PM exposure indoors comes from particles that started out outdoors. Oh, okay. From things like traffic, right? Sure. Or industrial processes or agriculture makes a lot of particles, they get generated outdoors and come in your house and that's where you get exposed. So a lot of that exposure is from stuff from outside the home, not what's happening inside the home. Gotcha. But, cool. but, but yeah, you are right to point out that globally, from a health perspective, particles are, have the biggest health impact of all the things we know. So controlling particle exposure is very important. And how does that translate then into a, an indoor cooking environment? Well, indoor cooking just adds to that issue, right? And, nice. and the question that you could ask the question, what fraction of all the indoor particles is from indoor sources and outdoor sources? Um, and the answer is, uh, it depends a lot. <laughs> if you never, if you for example, if you never cook or burn any candles, all the particles right. came from outside, for sure. Sure. If you cook, they came from inside. So when we, when we do field studies in people's homes, the variation is quite large. It depends a lot on are people cooking or not. Are they using their range hoods or not? Are they burning candles or incense or not? Big right. variability. But the homes, the homes with the high particles are going to have their worst health effects. Obviously. Gotcha. And um, I, in the chart where you're showing the NOx levels for cooking, yeah, I know there's a th that one line is a, a one hour threshold. Right. So what happens when you average those Right. Curve so, values. Right. So, so the analyses that we did just looked at the time above that one hour threshold. And for particles, it's not, it's a, it's a daily average. It's a 24 hour threshold. Right. 
So you place on those charts during the cooking, the particles were insanely high. But when we do the analysis, we're doing a 24 hour average. So the 24 hour average particle concentrations are of course much lower. Right, and I was just they, they curious. Have they, just have, they just have a different time basis that yeah. various health authorities have set. And I'm not a health expert. I, I use those numbers, I don't make those numbers. I understand. I was just curious, I mean, yeah, you can have a, a spike, but what you care about is within the time boundary. Yeah, you, that's right. You, for, for PM, you average it out over a day. For the NO2, you average over an hour. I gotcha. And that and that's those are the things that went into the model then, those Correct. averages. Okay. Gotcha. Interesting. And has the model been then verified with physical tests then? Oh, for sure, right. I mean, I gave a very high level overview, right? Okay. The, the, the modeling is, is, it's almost the other way around. We use the physical uh, test to develop the model, right? I so see. The model is just a simple mass balance. I don't want to get too technical, but basically it's just a basic mass balance. And the critical thing for these mass balance models is what you, what's your inputs in terms of airflows? What are your inputs in terms of emission rates and so on? And that's what came from the laboratory and the field test. That's what informed the mass balance model. I gotcha. But you know, when we look at the concentrations it predicts, of course, it predicts back the concentrations we measured because we use those as the input. If you see what I mean, it's something a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? We use what we measured in people's homes to develop the model. So we run the model, we get those same numbers back. If that's if that's that makes sense. And was the data gathered from different sized spaces I, I... that's right yeah okay this is at lbl in recent years we've done like probably 50 or 60 homes specifically for this and another 50 or 60 tangentially for this and about 20 to 30 apartment buildings and they're all different sizes different occupancies some people cooked all the time some people never cooked and and it's not just lbl right there's lots of other researchers that have been involved in this there's an it's almost an international effort in some ways Gotcha. Fantastic. I, I appreciate the input. No problem. Yeah, I, I have to go in a minute or two, but I can answer probably one or two more questions. Thank and you. I'm happy to answer questions by email afterwards if some of the things come up. <laughs> I, was say, okay. I, can, I, can collect, I can collect further questions. Okay, cool. And send them to you, Ian. But uh, maybe give Andrea a chance. Andrea, go ahead. Andrea, yeah, sorry. thank you. Um, Andrea from the IW, I just had a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. It, with the studies that you're referencing, where I know you just said that they um, were different size houses and right. um, you did apartments as well. Um, but I'm curious if there was um, variation in the time that the structure was built. Because um, as we see now, homes are getting tighter and so that creates more issues oh. and more need for ventilation. Um, and I also would be very interested to see your list of references. Um, my background is research. So um, looking through the methodology and really understanding um, the studies would be very important to me. So thank you. Sure. So um, I, absolutely, like I said, I'll, I'll share my slides after this and, and you, you can go and look at those references and I'm happy to chat about them. Um, in terms of the, you asked about the age of the buildings. They were all over the place, honestly. Um, but in terms of cooking, the age of the home mostly affected things like how big is your kitchen? All the homes tend to have a smaller room for a kitchen. And uh, you know, since the 1980s, basically all new single family construction, a lot of apartments have gone to this open plan thing. There's no interior walls anymore. So you have effectively a bigger volume. And that, that bigger volume changes the concentrations that we measure for the same cooking event. But there's a, a range of all that in our studies. Some, some have small kitchens, some have big kitchens. Great. Um, last question here, Mike, go ahead. Hello, Mike. You're muted. I can't hear you, Mike. Ah, video, but no sound. Okay. <laughs> all right. Great to see you, Ian. Uh, thanks for taking the question, Caroline. So this is all going to inform the proposal, I take it, that um, the mechanical tag we'll hear today about uh, uh, stimulating capture efficiency and flow rates. And Ian, I just wanted your quick thoughts on um, the potential for reducing the number of rows in the table and whether that has mm. merit to go with like one capture efficiency for electric and one for gas. That's a, that's a great question, Mike. And one um, uh, I've asked myself, actually, uh, there is an argument 
this gets into you know how codes are enforced and used, right? And there's an argument for simplicity. It makes it easier for compliance, or right? if you're a builder or a designer, if there's only one number instead of four. And also for if you're a code official, it makes your life easier. And I guess the question is, can we technically, you know, is there enough technical justification to say, um, make that 5% capital efficiency differentiation or are we changing the airflows? And so from the technical point of view, the answer is yes, these, the, that variability is justified. But from a code design enforcement point of view, um, then sometimes we have to compromise with these things, right? And uh, you know, if the, if that's ultimately what's decided, uh, I I'll be fine with that. I don't really have a, a horse in this race, if you will. Um, but if you're asking me if 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 we could simplify this to one row for electricity and one row for gas, probably that would not be the end of the world. Right. All right. Thank um, you. It's a technical compromise, but you know that's that's fine. So if you if you wanted to pick some numbers that were in the middle of the range there, or conversely, if you wanted to be, uh, I, I think for indoor air quality, we tend to try and be more protective. So you would end up picking the higher capture efficiency and the higher CFM numbers to make sure that if you do live in an apartment, you don't get overexposed. Um, so if we were to pick one number, my strong preference would be for the higher flows and capture efficiencies for that reason. Because we're also protecting the most vulnerable population, by the way. Um, if we look at the statistics of who suffers from asthma and, and who goes to emergency room the most, all those sort of things, it's low income people in apartments. They need the most protection. So I would go with the, that's why I would go with the numbers for the, in the table that I showed, the less than 750 square foot numbers, if you had to pick one. But like I said, you guys are going to talk about this a lot more, I'm sure, about. The compromise between complexity and simplicity and, and catching all the technical information and that sort of compromise. And I'm totally aware that these things happen because as Mike knows, I've been in this world a long time of informing codes and standards. So that was a long-winded answer to your question, Mike. <laughs> but, but yes, you could pick one row, but if you're gonna pick a row, it should be protected. I guess that's that's the, the short for summary. Thanks, Ian. No problem, Mike. Cool. Great. Um, Thank you so much, Ian. Ian, for sharing your knowledge with this group. Appreciate it. Um, with that, I think we'll move on to Kevin. And um, Thanks, everybody. Your guest. I, I have to fly. Bye now. Thank you so much. Oh, did, did Randy have more to add? Yeah, I guess, Kevin, the, the floor is yours. It, yeah, that, oh. yeah I, I had some other things. And again, I, I didn't know exactly how this was going to work out today. I didn't know Mike Moore was going to be on the phone as well. So um, he can he can help kind of cover the points that I had. But um, again, how this was presented to me was Washington was looking at copying what California was doing. And Kevin reached out to me as the chair of the range hood rating metrics group at ASHRAE 62.2 that we're kind of work, we're working on that. And again, what California did is you know, the right direction. We're moving that way. Again, very pro ventilation, both for electric and gas. Um, we need that. But what I would say is where we are with the ASHRAE group is we will be fine tuning the effort. Um, as I mentioned, there's nominal installed airflow. If you want to think about the back pressure, that's in the, the ducting when the range hood is operating. Um, what was done in, in Brett's modeling was a little more conservative than what we're seeing with uh, the recent data. And Mike Moore and I um, just went over. So it's, you know, it's likely that ASHRAE will end up with something slightly different. And we're already trying to work to get to the next California building code cycle. So California has theirs going on every three years. So we're trying to get our work done with ASHRAE 62.2 to refine that so that California could adopt that the next time round. And I'm, I'm just trying to highlight that we wouldn't want multiple numbers out there because it's very hard for manufacturers to, to try to meet from that standpoint, which would require special labeling. 
So again, if, if there's the ability to you know, push external ventilation um, with what you're doing, but not set requirements until we've established them. And then, as I said, ASHRAE 622 will come through and, and you can highlight those numbers and, and maybe you could even write in um, reference 622 for, for what you would be doing for your future building code. But that's, that's really what, it, what I have there. Um, also, I, I'm from the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. I guess I should have introduced myself. Um, so we represent major appliances, portable appliances, floor care, um, range hoods are within that. Also wanted to mention that we are very active on the gas range side of things. We are uh, part of a group that's being led by CPSC to look at establishing NO2 limits for ranges because currently there are no requirements for that product. And so again, proactively, we're, we're part of that effort to, to change that, as well as there's work going on with hydrogen, um, you know, 100% hydrogen, which would replace natural gas that's being done within the, the technology area. Um, I think the last thing that I'd say, um, then again, um, was maybe just something that I highlighted when Ian was on the phone, which is the capture efficiency that we're going to. We're also doing work on that. Um, the test that's called out by California is a, is a valid test. We're just having some repeatability and re reproducibility problems. What we've seen is from a test run in the morning to a test run in the evening, as much as a 10% variation in the capture efficiency. Um, again, same, same room, same TEDA, test set up. And so if you could look at you know, trying to certify a product and it tested at one point at, at one level and then at another time at another level, it's, it's hard to establish what that would be, which again, could just get into issues. So we expect to have that resolved in the next you know, six to nine months, which would fit our timeline to adding this to ASHRAE 622 or the, the next publication for that that would then meet the next publication of the California building code. So let me just stop and see if there's any questions or any additional comments. Thank you so much, Randy. Uh, Johnny, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Randy, for coming. This is interesting. Um, I've had two questions. Well, one for the ASTM standard, because the language in the table is a CFM or capture efficiency requirement, um, we're not requiring people to follow the ASTM standard. It is like actually just creating more flexibility. So if people want to go the route of getting a, a hood that has that capture efficiency, they can, but they could also just specify a product that reaches a specific flow rate. They can, and there's plenty of products out that meet the requirements that California established. But if you go back to what Brett had, as he mentioned in there, he said that they went to the conservative side when they established all of that. Well, what we're doing is we're going back through ASHRAE is you know, we're going to be doing a lot more testing, a lot more verification of that. And we're gonna get a much better correlation between CE and CFM. And it's likely that for the same CE that a lower CFM could be, could be um, actually measured with what we're seeing. So that, that's what I'm saying is that, you know, that there's conservativeness in the table and they went with what they, they needed to do at the time. Again, um, a lot of very good analysis, but as we're going back through and re recreating that larger sample size, looking at various things, we're, we're seeing that there's, you know, those numbers may change just a little bit, but our initial ASHRAE proposal would be the same thing, which would be CE versus, um, as well as a CFM. So it's looked very, very similar to what California is doing. It's just the numbers may change based on the current analysis we're doing. Thank you. That, that kind of brings me to my second question, which is um, Mike Moore actually recommended a simplification and I'm glad you brought that question up. It sounds like Ian thinks that's amendable. So I'm, I'm amendable to that if Ian was, because um, you know he's the expert <laughs> but if we were to simplify that table um then if we were to go to uh you know a 280 cfm or 250 cfm 
requirement. I think Ian uh, suggested a requirement of, uh, I think 250 or 160, I think is what your, your suggestion was, Ian. Or I'm sorry, Mike. Yes, so it was um, um, the highest category for the electric range, 160 CFM is very easily achieved by most market majority of range hoods. Um, I'd say the overwhelming majority there. And, uh, and then for um, the hood over a combustion range, I look at um, the HBI had suggested 250, that's an 80% target. It's not the 85% target at the far upper end. Uh, the reason 250 and not 280 is that it's a big jump from where we are today, uh, 100 to 250. Um, so you're getting a lot more capture efficiency than you would be getting at 100. Uh, the difference is 5% in the performance. And, um, and when you look at product availability and cost associated with that, there are going to be a lot more products available at 250 than at 280. Um, what I saw in just a survey of um, the HVI database of products that are 280 and above, um, when I looked for retail pricing for those, it was, it was about a $200 jump um, yeah. versus uh, products that are that are lower. So you're, you're definitely stepping into another tier when you hit that 280, which is why 250 totally. was recommended there. Chris, can you lower the screen a little bit? I'm sorry, uh, go down. And, and I guess. Keep going. That There's question a, was that cost brought? Analysis. Yeah, sorry, the cost analysis is what I was looking for. Um, is that kind of what you're talking about here? Uh, there's a 200, this is the incremental cost. Um, is this what kind of matches your, this is what came out of the uh, CEC analysis. Does this kind of match what you're looking at, Mike? Right, and it was, yeah, $200 difference from what was estimated here to what was uh, being seen for the for the um, 280 CFM. So it says that there's about a $60 difference between a 250 and a 280 here. Right, and that's not what I was seeing um, okay. in the research that, uh, that I did for HVI. And can you go down a little bit more on product availability? There's a, yeah, this is what, was published based on the research. It, it looked at, you know, 66 products and uh, different types here. And, you know, when you, when you get your microwave range hood, very few reach it. <laughs> um, but right. when you start getting into under cabinet or chimney, you know, you have 91% of products reaching at 250 and 72% reaching at 280 for vertical. So. Yeah, what I'd like to maybe just jump in here is, is highlight what I was mentioning about nominal installed airflow. So you're talking about, and, and I don't know, Mike, if that's where you were looking at what the rating point was in there and, and comparing that. But the likelihood that range hoods that are rated today at 280, when we put in nominal installed airflow, that airflow is going to drop. It will be um, more restrictive so that that airflow will drop. Um, they still may be, um, we'll be working through the, the capture efficiency measurements with that. But then when you would then look at the products that then would have, have to meet that higher airflow, you're now looking at different products than what were done in this table. So this is where what I was talking about with the, the changes we're making to the ratings themselves, where the ratings are going to be more representative of current field measurements will reduce airflow, which will re reduce the number of products that meet that requirement. And the ones that would meet that would likely be the ones that Mike's highlighting, which would be the ones that have the higher cost. Right, I think it's important to note that what Randy's saying here is that uh, <clears throat> these should really be viewed as interim numbers um, well, in terms of the CFM, especially the capture efficiency are health-based numbers that are being, you know, um, used right there uh, to to um, affect the exposure for the occupants in the zone and to ensure that you have a um, a reasonable amount of uh, a reasonable amount amount of protection for the occupants. Um, and it should be pointed out that this isn't protecting the, the cook. This is protecting a person in the middle of the living room, basically, in the well mixed zone. 
So you could argue for higher capture efficiencies if you're looking to detect the cook and those in the immediate vicinity of the, of the cooking area. But um, if, the, if the tag moves forward with these, these CFM, um, you should note that, uh, that these are just CFM that are, that are today or you know, two years ago correlated with the targeted capture efficiency. And the actual CFM needed, as Randy said, is something that's going to vary moving forward. So um, uh, this should be revisited in future cycles too. Yeah, which was just my statement, which is we're in the process of making that change. If, if Washington does choose to, again, push forward with this, you know, choosing a, a not as conservative of a number, so again, not as high of a number from a CFM standpoint as we're likely to see those numbers come down as we change some things. And then also um, the ability to go with one number. And, and I'll just state that I'm supportive of the 250 CFM, I think on the California submission when that, um, HVI from Mike's side turned that in, AHAM turned in 240 CFM is what our data was showing slightly different directories between AHAM and HVI, but we're both doing the same thing. So it is showing that um, lower CFM target is more likely to be the, the appropriate one for that 80% capture efficiency. Randy, I think we'll go to Eric next. Sorry, I've already covered this. I missed the first half hour of the meeting set of conflict, but um... I guess my my big concern, especially in multifamily, is makeup air. Um, you know, Washington's energy code is very stringent on the envelope tightness, um, and it's going to be really stringent in one or two code cycles here. Um, you know, we're 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 seeing a lot of projects, you know, having very tight air barriers in their multifamily buildings. Um, so I guess my question was around this testing: is it what type of facility is it being done in? Is it being done, you know, is adequate medic up there being provided to the hoods? Is it because it's done in some testing lab or, you know, what is the concerns really about makeup there and what have been other discussions about, uh, you know, basically as a, as a designer in, in Washington state, you know, all of our drawings go out that's saying that the operable windows have to be open when you're running your range hood to provide makeup air in a multifamily facility because the 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 twenty the the IMC International Mechanical Code exempts this exhaust in R2 from pressure equalization. Um, so you know, I know there are some potential changes in this proposal that helps address that, but I was wondering if you could speak to how the testing is being done and what your thoughts are on makeup air and how that is important to the hoods. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Um, I, I would say makeup air is very important. We we are monitoring that as we're doing the capture efficiency and um, testing and making sure that the room pressure is appropriate um, with that. It, it is very common for the manufacturers to say, open up windows. I believe the 400 CFM is, is the real cutoff that says you need to have that. But I, I, and I don't have the California code right here in front of me, but I thought that there was a requirement for additional makeup air in that code. Um, and there was some ERV requirements potentially as well. And Mike, is it okay if I, I lean on you a little bit on, on makeup air and what was in Title 24 for California? Sure, yeah. Um, California has the same requirement as 62.2 in that regard. So you look at the two, um, two largest exhaust fans and, and then you look at the square footage and the CFM of the two largest exhaust fans. If it, it, if it exceeds like 15 CFM per square foot, I think, per 100 square feet, then, um, then you're required to have makeup air. But, um, and then of course, uh, Washington State has a, the 400 CFM makeup air requirement. But Eric, I, I share your concerns in multifamily dwelling units, um, especially if you have combustion appliances within the space, um, you know, that, then that becomes a much larger concern. And, uh, and it is a design challenge. Um, we still have to get the pollutants out and, 
you know, this might uh, steer some designers towards more electric appliances to be able to specify a lower CFM that's less challenging from a makeup air perspective. Others um, may want the higher end, if you will, gas and, uh, and go with that and then just figure out how to, how to deal with that makeup air um, if, uh, if it becomes a, an issue that they need to design around um, and what solutions they'll have for that. So do you know that the 62.2 table with the, the largest two sources, is that based on testing in a single family home that has much more surface area or is it in a studio apartment that has, you know, 12, 12 lineal feet of exterior wall on it? Yeah, it's frankly just an old requirement. I mean, really a, uh, a thoughtful requirement would, would be based on the tightness of the dwelling unit and the available amount of infiltration, the depressurization, the uh, combustion appliances being in the zone, those kind of things. 62.2 is more just a rule of thumb. Yeah, and I, I know when you take those like infiltration equations out of 62.2 for like a studio apartment shows you're gonna get, you know, five to 10 CFM of infiltration under a, a typical fairly tight building. So it's basically nothing in comparison to any of these hood CFMs. It's a design challenge, definitely. I, I have uh, Johnny, go ahead. Yeah, I have one more question for, I think Randy, you got to go in five minutes. So Randy and Mike. Um, <clears throat> so I, I hear you on the, you know, the CFMs could change because there's like more analysis being done and that could lower the CFMs. Um, as the, as a, ASTM standard gets refined a little bit more, which I think you said is, is happening in the next year or so. Is that correct? Should be in the next six months. We'll have six those months. improvements made. So in the next six months, like the ASTM standard is improved, uh, wouldn't products be able to comply with the uh, the capture efficiency route, um, and thus would be able to go for a lower CFM if that's how, how the ASTM standard shakes out and, and the uh, it's shown that you can get to 85% capture efficiency at you know 250 CFM. That is an option. It's just the cost to do that and the time to, to be able to do that. And that's, as manufacturers are always trying to, to line up to hit where the, the changes are being made. It, I would just say that, and especially in today's supply chain, um, critical world where it's hard to get anything, not just microchips. Sure. Um, it's just going to take a while to, to execute that. So, you know, typically you want to get the requirement in place and let the design get set and robust so that you don't have nuisance operation issues. And then you go to manufacture that. And so that's, that's just taking a lot longer than it used to in today's world. If these, you know, these, uh, this code would not go into effect until July 1st, 2023. So after the STM standard is finalized and it's not like homes beginning July 2nd will suddenly require these range hoods. It'll take a little while. Um, would not that allow enough time between when the STM standard for when the products might become available or are you suggesting that it would take longer? You said July 1 of 2023? Yeah. Yeah, that's clearly not enough time because you're going to have your ASTM requirement set by January of 2023 and then getting into a test queue, get your data. If you needed to revise anything or revise your, your claims, you're, you're looking at at least um, nine to 12 months. We, we saw this same issue when California put in the previous requirement in 2019 where they had to be in a directory and everybody just lined up and overloaded labs. So I would say, you know, you're basically a year away from that and, and you're not going to have products if they were going to be redesigned available by July of 2023. And Randy, is there one test lab at this point to do this or do we have multiple? Well, we're based on our learning from the California one, we are working through where um, the ASTM work that we're doing in the round robin, we're, we're testing in four different labs 
one of those being a manufacturer lab, one of them being Ian's lab um, that was on there. And then we've got two other labs in parallel. But it would just be, you could say, the two or three of those that would be used for certification. Right. So a little bit better bandwidth from a lab standpoint, but still, um, you know, we're, we're learning that you've got to get calibrated gases and you've got to have some of these other things in place. So even once we get the requirement made, there may be lab improvements that need to be made before somebody can actually test to the latest version. And, and one more. So uh, since California is already requiring this, aren't you already having to make products available to comply with California's requirements? And they, they will start six months before this. Again, with the dual method, um, with that we have the uh, the other option, but we are still you know, looking at potential claims for CE values um, that are that are working towards that, that are just living with the, the variation. So they're building additional tolerance into that, which requires some potential redesign of products. So Thank I'd you. say it, it is going to happen, but it's really messy right now. And so with all of the improvements, it, it's going to make it much easier to execute. And then you're going to have much more products on the market, which would then drive down the price for a consumer or builder. Thanks, Randy. And let's go to Nancy. Well, I've got about probably two minutes left, if, if we can. Sure. Nancy, did you have a question for Randy? Um, no, I have comments. So if you want to deal with questions for Randy, go ahead first. Thank you. Ian, is your question for Randy? Yeah, I was curious about um, part of this proposal is talking about potentially making demand control ventilation an option. And I was just curious kind of what products are out there, the availability of demand control ventilation products for this residential hood market and kind of what the associated cost might be. Um, I, I can't speak too much of that because it's it would be company specific on who has demand response, but there are some products out there. What I can share with you is that uh, we are working with the UL safety standard on range hoods and making sure that that, that is properly managed from a, a product requirement standpoint and we don't have any unattended consequences. Um, for example, one thing that we've run into is that if you had a um, potential cooktop fire from this and the range could turned on that it may not turn on the fire alarm. And so the question is whether um, you're taking that smoke out, does that fire drop down or does that additional oxygen, oxygen actually cause the, the fire to escape and get into the, the cabinets? Um, we've seen that in, in a couple instances where we're trying to, to look at this is that that automatically turning on hood is defeating other safety devices. So again, we've, we've got to make sure these things are compatible um, to be able to work through that. So that's that's what we're making sure that that safety standard is in first, in place in first for range hoods. And again, we're looking at not only proximity devices, but particle devices and um, other things that would all be covered with this update to the safety standard. Uh, thank you. And I just had one more question because um, I was trying to look at some hood specifications in this capture efficiency. I'm trying to kind of just look on some random different manufacturers for that efficiency rating, and I haven't seen anything. Has that been adopted like in cut sheets for specific units yet? And uh, not a wholesale change because of the repeatability and reproducibility issues we're working through, as well as the ability to use a CFM at this time. So there are some companies out there claiming some CE values to that ASTM test, but it, it is not broad across the industry. And those aren't certified either, right? Right. Yep. That was all my questions. Thank you. Okay. So much, Randy. We really appreciate your time and expertise. Thanks for joining. Okay. Thank you. Bye. All right. Uh, Nancy. 
Well, <clears throat> sorry, I was just um, Eric's comment about makeup air um, triggered some real concerns to me. I would like to see these exhaust fans actually perform better than most of the ones that I think are put in low income housing actually do. Um, I think we have a health problem. It's been documented for a number of years with cooking. We need the makeup air. We don't need to go back to the 1990s with um, the 70s, 80s, whatever, where we weren't getting enough ventilation and we were dealing with a lot of mold. We also want people to run exhaust fans in order to evacuate the moisture. Uh, if California has already adopted this, then we know the manufacturers are already working on it. Um, waiting for ASHRAE 62.2 is, is just going to delay us for quite some time because first they'll do it and then maybe the international codes will do it. I don't know how long that takes, but I've never seen it work very fast. Um, so I'm, I'm hearing a lot of, of roadblocks being put up that would um, stop us from doing what we might, what we know is, is right and that we know that manufacturers will um, respond to the requirements. That's all. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Johnny. Yeah, sorry, I know I've talked a lot. Um, I hear you on the makeup air, and I am actually kind of of two ways about this. And and I, I think Eric has been pushing pretty hard for makeup air because of the situations he's describing. But I've also heard from other folks who have concerns about lowering the makeup air requirement. Um, I would like some direction from the tag on this. Um, maybe we can just have a short conversation. I don't want to be too long on like whether or not we should be moving towards lowering. The makeup air requirements, which is currently 400 CFM to being a lower value. Um, it would increase the cost and increase penetrations, which could reduce energy efficiency. It would also reduce the likelihood of having there be, you know, pressurization problems. So I'm open to hearing about that. I'd like direction on that for next week when we bring the final language. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, would, I just wanted to speak to Johnny's question there. I'm not on the tag, but I've done a lot of thinking about makeup air in, um, in dwelling units. And I think that um, if, the, if the tag is gonna go that direction, you probably should assign a work group to it because there's a lot to consider in terms of the effect of building air tightness and um, the interplay of your combustion appliances on, um, on your makeup air needs. And, so yeah, instead of just picking a number and going for it, um, I would just recommend that there be a, a work group assigned to this because it, it does require a lot of uh, a lot of noodling. Thanks, Mike. Um, Valerie, did you want to speak to what you put in the chat? Sure. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Makeup air is actually um, base code, and the uh, under 2018, the residential code removed the makeup air for uh, gas appliances, I mean, electric appliances. So makeup air is a 400 CFM that's required, but if you have just electric appliances, you don't, you no longer need it in the residential code. The IMC is different. The IMC is concerned about makeup air, just as Eric said, because you would start pulling in air from unknown areas such as corridor and maybe somebody else's unit. But in a single family and home, you're just pulling it in from outside, hopefully it's not the garage. Great, thanks. Um, Jonathan. Yeah, actually I actually have a quick question from Mike Moore, if that's acceptable. Um, I believe at the beginning of these conversations, you had mentioned you had done some HVI research. And, and so my question into this is, as I do a lot of field work, 
uh, the typical install I see in apartment complexes um, are microwaves being used as the ventilation process. And so is there a list of items that's readily acceptable that meets this in the microwave range world? Because that is the typically used device that I see in multifamily projects. So there are, thank you, Jonathan, for the question. Uh, yeah, there are uh, microwaves that are certified by HVI and, uh, and listed in the database over the range microwaves. Um, and 160 CFM, what I found at the time was about the lowest end of the certified values for, um, for a high speed for a unit. Um, so your entry level range hood, and I'd, I'd have to go double check the OTR numbers to figure out where they land on this. But what I was seeing was like entry level high speed was right at about 160 CFM. That's at a 10th inch water column. Um, you can expect to see more. Uh, resistance in that, more back pressure than that in the in the field. Um, <clears throat> so you're not probably getting that once it's installed, but that's the rating point today. And do those microwaves also meet the scone rating that's actually specified in the specification as well? Right, getting to the three zone requirement that like 622 yeah. has it's, uh, and that's listed here. Um, that is more challenging for, for many OTRs, but there are, there are compliant products out there that could hit that 10th inch at 160 CFM or 160 CFM at a 10th inch and get the, uh, the three zone rating at this point, yes. Excellent, and those are available in the Pacific Northwest? Uh, yes, they, I mean, they're just, you know, major manufacturers who make these and it's not the full product line, like, this is going to cut out some of the uh, lower tier entry level appliances. Um, they'll either have to be re-engineered or they'll, they'll fall out. So this will add cost, um, no doubt about it. But, um, but yeah, that's just a, um, you know, California decided to go this way for indoor air quality reasons. And it's hoping that the market's going to catch up um, in terms of costs and that more products will be available in the future. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. I just want to make sure that there was products that could meet the demand um, available currently. I know that, uh, and specifically in the microwave range, because like I said, it's the typical install that we see. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And AHAM has a, their own directory of um, that's solely OTRs, I believe at this point. So you could go there and, uh, and check that for a list of products. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Nancy, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I had forgot to mention one of the complaints I deal with frequently is people's health being impacted by what their um, neighbors are doing in apartment buildings. So addressing this issue of pulling air from adjacent apartments is, is really um, important for people's health. And on these microwave exhaust fans, the low end ones, which typically go into the lower income buildings, um, I don't think most people know how um, inadequate those are. I certainly didn't know when we put one in and then um, yanked it out and replaced it with a decent exhaust fan. It's people just don't know. I think that's unfair. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I have a question maybe, Eric, for you or Valerie or Mike, um, just about, you know, the CFM ranges that are shown here, ideas have been discussed today about potentially um, shortening this table to have a row or two, maybe just one CFM requirement for each type of range. And, you know, the numbers in front of us are significant, you know, generally below the 400. So just curious, you know, the makeup air issue and the 400 CFM, how do you feel like this proposal, I guess, impacts that already existing threshold differently maybe than it does right now? Yeah, I'll try to answer that. Um, the, the Right now, these flow rates aren't going to cause any makeup air requirements in um, IRC dwelling units. When you're dealing with um, dwelling units that are within the scope of the IMC, um, you, uh, you also 
are not going to be over 400 CFM, but you do have that requirement for um, balanced ventilation or right, Eric, where you have to balance the airflow. Um, in Washington, well, and in the IMC, uh, there's an exception for R2 that you don't have to maintain free of pressure equalization. Okay. So all, pressure equalization. all jurisdictions under IMC, at least, I don't know what's in the UMC. There, there's an exception in, you know, from pressure equalization. Washington's been tw tweaking that except that exemption over the past few code cycles. So we currently require the whole house ventilation system to now be balanced. So we have to have pressure equalization for the whole house system, but any local exhaust, but and Johnny's proposal here is, is proposing to modify that now as part of this. So um, yeah, I mean, the current status quo has been a minimum CFM of 100 for intermittent and then um, and then going over 400 for Washington State required makeup air and then Seattle's had 300 CFM requiring makeup air and those thresholds have aligned with the energy code requirements for when you need a motorized damper on your outlet so anything over 400 CFM they need a motorized damper on the exhaust outlet in Washington and then in Seattle it, it was set down to 300 CFM where you need a motorized damper on the to make the envelope tighter so um, anyways but we're we're seeing tighter and tighter buildings you know, folks are having to pass air barrier tests at very tight thresholds. So the, the need for makeup air is, and then also because of the energy efficiency requires of the uh, requirements, the energy code, we're seeing much lower corridor makeup airflow rates having to be maintained to meet energy code requirements for these multifamily projects. So, you know, you really are pulling your air from your neighbor's unit and whatever you can get under the door or you really need to open an operable window. Um, you know, we don't let high rise projects remove operable windows, even if they're fully conditioned, they have to have an operable window, at least in the kitchen in our designs um, to have a source of makeup there, uh, even for these small hoods. So, I mean, there, the more we can do about awareness of makeup air and what is the path um, there's a bunch of education that needs to happen to, with uh, folks when they run their clothes dryers or when they run their range hoods that they need operable windows open if there isn't a source of makeup air in these buildings. Can we scroll to the language in the proposal that requires makeup air? I'm not. So you have to up, uh, should be right below. Sorry. All right. right, uh, right. So, yeah. So there's a section 501 for pressure equalization. So Washington changes that a little bit from model code. In model code, it's just part of that paragraph. Um, so we make that an exception to having uh, pressure equalization. So it's a little clearer. Um, and so that right now that, that uh, Johnny has that set up, I guess, at the 400 CFM threshold and then there's the section about yeah makeup air um so yeah that you'd want to keep all that, that 400 if we're gonna if you're gonna i guess nancy if you want to require makeup air for all hoods then one way is to just not exempt them from pressure equalization in that section uh, and make that change um the other when you scroll down a little bit further in the proposal to the 5053 section um, for makeup, yeah, 5054 there, makeup air. Um, so, I, yeah, I guess Johnny's latest version has these set at 400 still, but you know, th those are the CFM thresholds you want to change if you want to lower, um, if, if you want all, you know, anything over 100. And, 200 CFM or whatever to have a makeup air hood, or you want everything to have a hood or makeup air source, excuse me, for the hood, then those are the CFM thresholds you need to start making proposal changes for. So in ventilation, it's important to get the bad stuff out and then introduce good stuff, right? Um, if you're cooking, you know, you've got let's speak generally here, bad stuff that needs to get out. 
So you need to have a hood that's capable of capturing that at the source. So it's important to move forward with a hood that actually works. That should be priority number one. And then secondarily, I would say it would be makeup error requirements um, and, uh, and understanding where that makeup error, uh, where that error is coming from. If you've got, um, uh, and that's gonna be conditional, right? And episodic. So um, maybe your neighbors are smokers. And in that case, you're introducing air that could be a poorer air quality. Um, in most cases, though, I would, I would assume that if you've got a gas stove running and you're cooking and you're producing a lot of NO2, that, um, that the coincidental um, infiltration that comes in during the operation of the range hood at uh, like 250 CFM is going to be of better quality likely than what you're getting rid of. So it's not a perfect improvement, but it's incremental. And there are better designs out there than... Um, uh, that would include makeup air, but it's uh, we're into perfect as the enemy of the good at, at some point. Thanks, Mike. That's helpful. That reference point for sure. Uh, Nancy, go ahead. Um, that sounds nice in theory, but not if you're allergic to smoke or if your neighbor's using incense or a pot. Um, this has become a huge issue. And as the, you know, buildings have to be balanced and we have to exhaust. And we also have to not bring in, I mean, I pull my hair out trying to help people um, when they have problems with their neighbors and they're getting sick. And some people get really sick. So it's just frustrating that building design can't be better. Uh, let's go to Austin. Um, is it possible that we could maybe propose a boost mode when the range hood is on that these ERVs that we're going to be placing into residential units goes into a boost mode um, to try to balance that make a bear a little bit? Or like have a... Uh, have most a... of these ERVs are 50 CFM. So if you're boosting it, you're going to 80. I mean, the... the uh, you know, it's just it doesn't even come close to making up air for the range. Yeah, I'd concur with that. I mean, most of the time, the exhaust and the ERV are controlled together. The supply and exhaust are controlled together, so it's going to boost both the inlet and the outlet. So you're you're, you're neutral air. I mean, what I'm hearing is that, yeah, the tag is going to need to make a decision on how important make a fair is to these and um, probably a separate motion to try to get a or a straw poll to figure out where where folks thinks we need to go for make a fair. You know, is this going to be based on CFMs or or is it going to be for all range hoods that that need make up hair? now based on how tight the buildings we're building are. So um, I don't know, There, it seems like we need to get kind of some feedback from the tag on how deep we want to go on this item, this code cycle. <clears throat> Just try to speak to the, a potential make a pair solution. So you could get an inline fan that, uh, that you put in for these scenarios that you, um, that you control along with the, uh, your range hood and getting an inline fan above 200 CFM is, is pretty tough, but there are probably some, uh, a few models out there. You're probably going to be paying about um, three, let's say uh, $200 or so retail for the, for the fan itself. Then there's the ducting that you have to think of, and then there's uh, conditioning considerations for when it's winter and you're blowing, you know, 200 CFM in of outdoor air. Um, so these systems can, easily be over, you know, a thousand dollars once installed. Um, so when we're talking low income and the episodic nature of this and trying to address it, it would, I, I agree, it would be great to have a solution for this. And, and there are solutions out there. They're, um, they're very expensive. It's a separate system and um, just something for the tag to consider. Especially since we just outlawed electric resistance heat. So a lot of these little Electric makeup our units are, I guess we didn't outlaw electric resistance. We, we 
we just adopted heat pumps with limited exceptions for electric resistance heat and natural gas heat. So yeah, it is going to be an impact on, you know, what kind of simple systems you can put in place to handle these types of uh, infiltration that need to come in for the hoods if, if we require makeup air uh, and don't allow people to open their window instead. So it's kind of education versus automation. <clears throat> Jonathan. So I had a conversation with John yesterday as he explained some of this stuff to me too, trying to catch me up on the swap out with Mike. And one of the concerns that I brought up with that gentleman too, after speaking with uh, Michael Lubliner, was the amount of punctures that we're gonna be creating in the envelopes with all these additional ventilation pieces. So my, my word of caution in this particular case would, uh, you know, apply the, the KISS philosophy here, right? Kind of keep it simple. Uh, we're already having problems with punctures and envelopes and in multifamily spaces and moisture move, movement and, and mold and band and rim joist issues. And we can go down the list of all this stuff. So all I'm saying is the more ducts that this group decides to put into the system, whether it's for ventilation or not, is going to also cause other issues to trickle in, such as envelope measure issues, air filtration, the wrong way, such as mold and mildew issues. So just be cautious about the amount of ducts that you want to shove into these 900 square foot units. But I'd also counter that if you're running the unit highly negative, that you are pulling in air through the joist space and through every little crack in your envelope. And so that is causing problems with the building envelope, right? I mean, that that is what's intentionally happening in these wood frame buildings is that the air is coming in from everywhere it can. And so if you don't have an intentional place for that air to come in, it is much worse long-term for the envelope of that building. Oh, no, building pressures is what I preach on all day long. You yeah. definitely got to keep attention to what you're doing to your builder, your building pressures, everything from running a dryer, for instance. Um, but in this particular case too, I'm trying to, you know, as, as like Buddha says, if you, if you can't help and do no harm, right? So I'm trying to, to just give out a word of caution that says, Hey, there's uh, there's more punctures here. We we could be causing some more problems. So so do, please do be careful about the amount of punctures that you're going to specify. Because just because you say you run a duct doesn't mean that's the only component in that puncture, right? We got sealants and, and adhesives and all this other fun stuff that gets applied, and and people have to check that stuff. And so I'm just I'm just giving a caution that if you can find a, an answer to the problem, which everybody's trying to do, uh, let's try to keep it uh, with, as simple as possible with the, with the least amount of punctures as as possible um, for, for maintenance purposes, for durability purposes, all the way around. I agree with you that we do need to be very cautious of building pressures. Yeah, and I guess to, to respond to Michael, Mike Moore's uh, comment, you know, a, a makeup air fan is one option. Another is just a louver with the motorized damper. So there, and just bring and opening that. So there is more than one solution. And right now the mechanical code does not describe or our state ventilation code does not require, does not describe what that solution is specifically unless we were to add that language. Valerie. Yeah, makeup air is pretty much handled by the jurisdiction on how they look at how it, how it can be brought in, whether it's a gravity damper or motorized damper. And Jonathan is correct about the building envelope penetrations, but in reality, local kitchen exhaust is not being used over a hood. Um, local kitchen exhaust is just a exhaust in the space that's being run through your ERV, and, and hoods are only being installed in high-end condos, and that's maybe 10% of the construction out there. So hoods are not actually being used that often right now in current construction. So I want to throw that in there. I know this is about hoods, but it really, hoods are not being used because of the wall penetrations, the cost of it, and low-income housing cannot afford a hood, so they just run it through an ERV, a local system. Does, does this code, does this add that to the what you're talking about, Valerie? Do you think this would this would force those those places to add hoods? 
No, this doesn't force them to add hoods, and this actually would force them not to add hoods. The only hoods will go in the high-end condos, and those hoods are going to be over 500 CFM, so they're going to need makeup air. Um, you just don't see hoods anymore. They don't put them in. They, they're not using them. They're using continuous exhaust from the space. And it, it has to do with wall penetrations. It has to do with the cost of it. And when you have an apartment building that has 500 units in there, it can add up. So they just don't put them in anymore. The, the current code requires, allows continuous local exhaust in the kitchen and would require a recirculating hood above the range still. Whether that's a recirculating microwave combination microwave or not, but yeah, if you go the continuous local exhaust, currently you still need the re recirculating hood. Okay, well, I think just to kind of recap, um, it sounds like obviously the final language is not ready to be acted upon today. It sounds like Johnny has asked for input on this issue of makeup air. I think we've heard um, some really thoughtful comments on the pros and cons of doing that. Um, Johnny, one potential path forward would be to develop that language for makeup air. Um, and then the tag could either decide to incorporate it or decide not to incorporate it um, at the meeting next week. That could be one potential option. I think we've also heard a couple of different ways of potentially providing that air. So it sounds like maybe a less prescriptive route um, might be desirable. Does that sound like a, a viable path forward or does anyone want to contribute, I guess, other input for how they'd like to see this proposal evolve? Uh, Jonathan. Just, just real fast, on today's invite, including the link, um, this most updated document was not part of it, which is why I asked about the available appliances that were there. So could we ensure that this new document gets back out for the next one? Out of curiosity, Johnny, if you could share that around, that'd be great. I didn't see the product availability chart because uh, the one that I have up on my computer doesn't have that included. Yeah, great point, Jonathan. For next week's meeting, any revisions, definitely the tag would like to receive those by end of day Tuesday. The posted version that you want folks to review on Thursday so that everybody has time to look at that prior to the meeting. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Eric. All right, Johnny, I didn't have a chance to look at the latest one either. So can we scroll up to the top and how you handled the continuous versus, so you left the continuous in there and are allowing the recirculating range hoods. So that would stay status quo with what we currently have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I originally was gonna change it to not required, but then there was gonna be a revolution among tag members. So I <laughs> went back to 30 CFM. I was going to also change it to air changes per hour as an option, but you know, it seems like 30 CFM is just the right way to go here. Thank you. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, one thing to think about is if <clears throat> if we do institute a makeup air requirement, then intermittence at that point becomes so expensive and so onerous, I would imagine that it would steer people naturally towards continuous. And if you're dealing with like 30 CFM in a kitchen during an NO2, big NO2 event, you know, it's not going to do much in terms of protection there. Um, so I would just recommend, you know, the, the, the tag consider that, that let's not make intermittent so onerous that we drive people to a worse solution. Thank you, Mike. Johnny, do you feel that you have um, input with which to work with over the next several days to continue iterating here? Yeah, it's it's clear as mud. I think I can probably figure it out. Um, I'll probably, I'll just kind of give you my thoughts. I'll probably work to simplify the table. Um, it'll either be 250 or 280 CFM. Um, 
you know, still thinking about that one. And, uh, and, and then for um, makeup air, I'm thinking of lowering the threshold to either uh, 250 or 300. Um, but I need assistance on going over some of this other stuff. So if anybody would like to be in a working group call, I could, I've like gone through pretty much every possible section you can think of in the mechanical code at this point that has any relationship to exhaust fans. And my brain is swimming with questions to make sure that this integrates well. There's also a few errors in the code. I think I found like tables that don't exist and things like that. So um, I'm kind of curious if somebody could help review that and maybe provide any context. Yeah. Um, could folks who are interested in being in a working group on this, um, yeah, raise your hand or Johnny, if you want to post your email in the chat and then folks who want to be involved in that can reach out to you to coordinate that. Or actually they could share their email in the chat and I could just create a group to be try better. Yeah, great point. If you'd like to be involved in the next iteration on this, yeah, go ahead, throw your email in there. All right. Well, we have other um, topics on our agenda today. So unless there's any other input anybody would like to provide on this one, I think we are looking for a motion um, to table both proposals 63 and 62 until next week. I'll move to table both 62 and 63. Thanks, Brandon. I'll second. Thanks, Nancy. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. All right. Thank you all. Do we get a break? Yes, we should take <laughs> a break. Um, how about we take a quick uh, four minute break and we will return at 10.40 a.m. Okay, everyone, welcome back after a quick break. Maybe if, um, Folks could just raise their hands if you're on the tag so we know we have enough people back in lieu of doing another roll call. We've got Brandon back, Andrea. Uh, Nancy, Chris, Valerie, are you all back yet? I'm here. <laughs> You're here. Okay. Okay. Great. Just checking to make sure we still have our quorum. Um, all right. Well, let's dive on in. So this is proposal 87. I think the document in front of you is the revised version. And with that, I will turn it over to Austin. Yeah, thanks. So we uh, revised this, uh, Eric and I, um, beginning of the week, and we sent this out. Initially, we were just trying to simplify the change with getting ready this ready getting rid of this ready access but um diving into a more we wanted to have it align up with npfa section 70 uh, a lot more npf 70 section 110 um so we we matched up a lot of the language uh including some more specifics about uh hinge panels adding more verbiage on um, the types of panels and what can be used in inlay, lay in ceiling tiles, uh, enclosed door, um, or other removable covers. We, we dropped the size down to match with that uh, NPFA uh, of 22 inches by 22 inches, um, and just kind of cleaned up some general language and just had the exceptions match the, uh, the above change to 36.6. So um, we think overall this makes a, a lot more specific sense. It's a lot more um, aligned to what's going on. Uh, thanks. 
and uh, it's uh, it seems a lot more forcible. And we also cleaned up just using the word appliance and not equipment as equipment has a very specific definition in the IMC. So we tried to just since all the other sections in 306 are talking up until this point are talking about appliances and that's the title of the section we kind of cleaned up the language again this is a, a Washington state section that's not in the model code that was introduced a couple of two code cycles ago and we've been tweaking since so yep great thank you both uh Jonathan May I make one small friendly suggestion, and that is to make the access, at least add the language, um, uh, made substantially airtight, because you do not define whether or not this is conditioned or unconditioned space, and you are creating a new puncture in the envelope. And I just want to make sure that it says somewhere in code that it has to be sealed. It's interesting how some of these things kind of slide through, like electrical outlets and ceilings don't have anywhere in the codes that it specifically says it has to be sealed. Um, and so I just don't want this falling into that same category. Does that make sense? And maybe it might be already taken care of with language somewhere that uh, I'm just not aware of, but I just wanted to throw that caution out there. So you wanted to say within the building envelope, because this is above the ceiling. Well, no, it just means substantially airtight, like like an attic access lid. Like there's a requirement. You're in saying if this, this, if this is an opening that's penetrating the envelope of the building, that it has to be airtight. Yes, that's all I'm saying. Because if it doesn't say it, you know someone's going to say it doesn't say it. And that becomes a technical issue for us as Wazoo. Does that make sense? Seems like that's an energy code requirement, not a mechanical code requirement. But. Fair enough. Um, Valerie. <laughs> I'm not sure about the NFPA 70. That... Um... That now makes the mechanical responsible for knowing the requirements of the electrical code. And the electrical code isn't that clear as far as if you're a mechanical person reading it, it depends on a lot of different things. And I'm not sure that's a good idea to leave that to the mechanical. I don't even have the NFPA 70. So you're making it my responsibility to check that that code versus the voltage that's in the space, the clearance for for working clearance, they have different clearance requirements. I, I think we could remove, I think I could just say to the working space and remove all that language if we wanna get rid of it. So. I, know, I know that's a problem out in the field having the mechanical code saying one clip, one, um, opening versus the NFPA saying another size opening, but now you're making it the responsibility of the mechanical code. Right. We are listing what that requirement is at the 22 inches, 22 by 22 inches. It also depends on how you, if it's in the, well, I've had them um, in drop ceilings and the electrical inspectors had different ideas about it on how you, how the the appliance is approached by somebody. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of different interpretations in NFPA 70. So um, I think the the this exception too, we'd want it to still say an electrical access is not required and just leave out um, per NF in accordance with, yeah. So then if you have, if you're just accessing a filter or something else on a piece of equipment that's not part of the main electrical access and you only have a 12 by 12 filter to get to, um, you wouldn't necessarily have to have a 22 by 22 panel. You could have a you know, 12 by 12 panel or something. So. <clears throat> so I guess one question, the functional change then that didn't exist before is reducing the size of that opening from 24 by 24 to 22 by 22. Um, I guess, could you just speak a little bit more to the, maybe the- Yeah, so, so past tag discussions were, there was 
I think it was three years ago, there was a discussion whether 24 by 24, is that exactly 24 inches or is that nominal 24 inches? Um, so knowing that uh, the 2020, 22 by 22 is what's referenced by, for NFPA 70 is the minimum size opening to get. Again, we're talking about the opening you got to get up through to get into what's called the working space. Um, so it was just cleaner to reference that same 22 by 22 and match that requirement because the electrical access is typically, you know, the oh, the most restrictive type access you're going to have. So well, if you leave it at 24 by 24, your the mechanical code is covered for the the 22, so we wouldn't have to worry about it. There may also be an issue with laying ceilings or with those you know T grids that they're 24 on 24 centered, so the actual access is slightly less than 24. So it's just to allow that wiggle room. So again, if we want to stay with nominal dimensions of 24 by 24 and it's a 23 and a half by 23 and a half is actual, I don't know. I think that was the concern last code cycle is, you know, so I thought it was a little bit, a little bit better to follow uh, the NFPA standard there. So since there's nothing in the mechanical code. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments for Austin or Eric on this one? If not, I think we would be looking for a motion of some sort. I'll move approval. Thanks, Nancy. If we, we've changed it, so it's not. It's not referencing any code, it's just making the minimum space 22 by 22 as opposed to 24 by 24, because what you're all saying is that's more logical in the field. Did I get that right? Yeah, it gives a little bit more flexibility in the actual size. You know, a, a, a 24 by 24 access panel may only have a 23 and a half by 23 and a half opening or something, right? So. Okay, I move approval. It makes sense to me. Thanks, Nancy. Is there a second? I'll second. Thanks, Chris. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. All right, motion carries. So our next two proposals are from Mike Lebliner regarding allowing 62.2 as an alternative um, compliance path. I imagine he is not here. I also, to my knowledge, I don't think either of these got revised at all. Um, Jonathan, don't know if you are prepared to speak to them. Uh, I'm a bit better prepared this time, I would say, for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, Mike made it sound like I didn't need really to be so prepared. So that was my, my, my rookie mistake, which won't ever be made again, I promise. Um, on the flip side of things, I did have a very lengthy conversation with Michael Lubliner about his proposal and his, his concerns were uh, the requirements of ERVs and, and low family multi-rise. Uh, when we're looking at all the proposals that are on the table, um, there is just a lot of changes that are happening in this code cycle. And, and what I mean with that is, is also, um, there's a lot of new things that are coming through, including these ERV requirements for low rise multifamilies. And it's creating a lot of uh, for, so for Mike's concerns was there was some additional punctures in the envelopes, um, how maintenance on these were going to be maintained, uh, specific, specifically like ERVs. And then if Johnny's heat pump hot water tank unit passes, the other concern was that um, 
seeing that COPs are currently not allowed in the energy code, you, you're looking at um, HSPF equipment. And so HSPF equipment typically isn't shared. And so you're looking at individual heat pump water tanks and units. Uh, so there's two more punctures because they will most likely be ducted because of volume, space, and, and sound constraints. Um, and so his, his issue was he wanted to make sure that there was an allowable path, which was 62.2's ASH rate version of the, the 2019 for ventilation purposes. Um, so that way, as these other issues have come up, there would be another alternative that could be used in case this other system just isn't working. Um, you know, and I've asked about examples on, on the heat pump one. We got this is a, that's a different conversation, and I'll get on that on the heat pump topic. Uh, but there wasn't a great response as to how they were going to deal with those punctures. So now if you deal with those punctures from heat pumps, you do those punctures from ERBs, and now we're maybe it might be proposing another one for ventilation or might not. It's just, it's getting convoluted. There's gonna be a lot of punctures. Who's gonna maintain these things? And so Luby was just wanting, Mike Lubliner was just wanting to make sure that there was an alternative path that could be used that could alleviate this uh, while the industry kind of sorts it out. Um, and so he's very adamant about just asking for the exemption. As far as the range of the proposals came across, the gentleman last time had asked about that. And, you know, as, as, as Luby and I had spoke about it, we were, we didn't care which way the, well, well we're specifically speaking as an educator, we're trying to be neutral. We do care. That was a wrong statement to use. It, you know, verbs are ter terrible. I apologize. Um, as far as an educator's perspective, uh, the ventilation for the, the exhaust hoods, it, it could go either way with us. Uh, we like the idea of health, you know, but it, it needs to be fully vetted out. I don't, I don't see the wrong with the proposal, but we're just, again, technical support. So, you know, with that being said, uh, we're really worried about, again, maintenance, penetrations. Um, if the vent hood passes, we'd be willing to accept it in the ash rate, you know, in this, in this little piece right here too. It doesn't, it's, it's ambiguous for us on, on this proposal. Um, if that's what needs to be done to satisfy the tag. But for the most part, uh, again, just, just reiterating, Mike was, was really worried about the new proposals not uh, going exactly um, as well in the real world as they are in the white paper and wanted to make sure there was another path that was viable for the state. I'd be open to any questions. Uh, Valerie, go ahead. Uh, do you have a, a section number in ASHRAE 62.2 that you'd like to put up there instead of just giving the whole code? Valley, um, <clears throat> I hate to say it. Every time you've talked, I've like stuck my ear to the computer. I'm just a deaf guy from working in the field too much. Is there any way you could turn your volume up for me or maybe could someone reiterate oh, that? Let me see. Um, I'll speak louder. Is there a code section to ASHRAE that you could add to that instead of instead of using the whole code? Uh, to use the, uh, yeah, I mean, we could definitely put this some language in here that says if the, um, uh, the mechanical ventilation requirement for the gas stoves is adopt, gas electric stoves is adopted, that it would, it would apply here too. Absolutely. We wouldn't have anything against that. Yeah, I guess on a similar vein, Jonathan, just concerned that by referencing, you know, the way the language is written here, 62.2.2019, are you just trying to refer to the ventilation quantities and approach allowed in that standard or all the different sections and all the different requirements and maybe just a bit more specificity on exactly which sections you're seeking to allow the alternative to apply to? Sure, my understanding, um, with the exception of the new proposals, Luby was 100% with uh, 62.2 2019. But there are some new proposals that change things, and, and we're willing to accept the group wisdom of the tag and modify this proposal with those things that are being accepted for the mechanical codes. Does that make sense? Like, so in other words, if you guys really want the gas and the electric stove top in here, well, let's means let's put that in here. Um, if uh, if something else gets voted on and it changes um, like the efficiency requirements of like the microwaves or something like that. Oh, let, let's put that in here, absolutely. But it's what we're looking for, for ventilation, for exhaust methods, for the, for the actual mechanical pieces themselves, installation and, and calculations, we are wanting to refer to 62.2, 2019. Thanks, uh, Eric. Yeah, so I guess we talked about this last time that this just makes it hard to enforce the code um, for the code officials. So again, this proposal doesn't really address 
flat. Um, uh, may I may I address that statement with ventilation is a tough topic for anybody and an actual, um, you know, uh, commissioning of systems in the field is, is probably, let's say, less than um, what we would hope for. And so while I understand what you're saying, at the same time, um, you know, what is everyone works is, is, is great by me. You know what I'm saying? Down the road five, 15 years from now. Yeah, so there's just differences in what folks are gonna be able to design to. Uh, again, I would recommend adopting, if this is adopted, adopting similar language to what we're using in 403.2 exception two, um, so at least we're consistent in the code language. Uh, I don't really like the deemed as an acceptable alternate um, language. Uh, so I think the language that, sh that says shall be permitted in that section is much better and more, more enforceable code language um, to be consistent with how we treat the alternate standards. So yeah, if the tag is considering adding this as an option, um, and then I would encourage the systems to have to be designed, um, and you know that an engineer record is responsible for the design of the system, that they're not just uh, a contractor installing to the system. So they're that they would have to, there has to be someone stamping uh, to this design, so you know that uh, someone's taking. Our responsibility for that design. So, <clears throat> I guess I don't have to raise my hand in my own proposal, do I necessarily? Go ahead, speak? Jonathan. Feel free to respond to any questions. Or okay, questions. excellent. Sorry, I'm still a bit new to this, so I appreciate the the, the cuddling me along here. Um, <clears throat> so, my question is: is then uh, I, I don't see why there's an unfair prejudice of design engineering requirements on ASHRAE 62.2, as we don't require mechanical engineers to do anything really in, in, in residential properties. Um, well, this is at least, you know, proposed the, for the mechanical, the this is proposed for the IMC, not the IRC. So this is, yeah, high rises and everything else. So I guess if, if, it, if we have a code that's going to be harder for a code official to enforce because they have to go learn a new code and a new standard. Um, that my recommendation would be that somebody needs to stamp and sign those drawings as part of that. So how are we develop that language. Sorry, Mike, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I have a couple concerns and it's great to hear that Jonathan's willing to you know, modify this to include other things that might be omitted, perhaps um, not intentionally. One is that uh, if you're putting this exception here underneath 403.4, then it removes the pointer for what to do with um, with uh, common spaces, corridors, et cetera. Right now, 403.4, you're directed there for group R occupancies. So it, this isn't just dwelling units. This is um, This is a section for um, for group R <clears throat> buildings. So uh, you get in this and then you've got the language that right here that point pushes you back out to ASHRAE 62.2 and that just addresses dwelling units. It doesn't address other spaces in group R occupancy. So um, we're left in no man's zone there. So that would need to be fixed. <clears throat> um, let's see, uh, the, there's a requirement here in section 403.4, one of the subsections for filtration of outdoor air with MERV 8. ASHRAE 62.2 doesn't have that. So by going to 62.2, you're, you're going to, you can introduce unfiltered outdoor air, which is uh, definitely problematic at parts of the year in Washington state. ASHRAE 62.2 does require MERV 6, but only if um, it's through an, uh, a system that's ducted with 10 or more feet of duct and um, and passes through a heating or cooling coil. So that would, you know, accept many small systems that are just discrete um, dedicated supply systems, for example, or H or ERVs. Um, let's see what else. This proposal would also circumvent the requirement that, um, or the prohibition in this section 
for CFI, uh, central fan integrated systems, to run continuously to provide ventilation air. Those systems can use a lot of energy. And, um, and ASHRAE 62.2 is just focused on the ventilation and not on the energy uh, consumption. And within this section of the um, IMC, at least in, in Washington state, there, uh, there's a provision that would address those systems and prevent their continuous runtime. So there are a few things like that that I think would need to be corrected um, before we could uh, go this direction without reducing the, um, the performance of the home in terms of ventilation and IEQ. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Jonathan, any thoughts there? Mm. As far as MERV specifications um, on air that's coming in, I, I get why you bring that up, but, but remember the purpose of this of this balanced exemption that Mike was looking for was specifically to not require ERVs and low rise multifamily units at this point in time until the, it can be fairly vetted on how it's going to interact with envelope measures, maintenance issues, and, and the chain. So while you bring that point up specifically, um, that is specifically why <clears throat> the exemption is being made is to allow for supply only or exhaust only systems in, in residential and low rise families. So balanced it's ventilation it's would it's still it's be required though, right? The way this exception's written. So you still have the same amount of penetrations regardless of uh, you would using. You would achieve the penalty for not balancing. So the only way to use 62 here is to use a balanced ventilation system. Right, and then here the language is balanced, yes. So we would balance it, but the original one is yes. So you, there is still gonna be balancing that is going on. That's the reason why Mike did put in the word balanced. What he was specifically worried about was the forcing of ERVs into low rise multifamily. Nancy, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now I am confused and I will, as you all know, I am very supportive of higher filtration rates on outside air. I, I'm not familiar with 62.2. I don't really deal with residential too much, except complaints that I get um, from existing systems. So if this is specific to um, an alternative to the ERVs, which is what I think I just heard. I guess I need it explained a little more. And I thought the ERVs were part of the energy code. Um, and sorry to jump back in, Nancy, on your on your aspect, but but to the other aspects, um, I believe it's ASHRAE 62.2 section 6.7 that refers to filtration. So there is a filtration requirement in in ASHRAE. And and my understanding, the gentleman from rushing is like from ASHRAE, and, and if you could speak on that, that would, that would be great. Um, otherwise, I could try to share a link here that I just pulled up real fast. Uh, this is Mike Moore. I can speak to it. I'm the chair of 62.2. Um, yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and there is a requirement for MERV-6 filtration for outdoor air only when it's introduced through a heating or cooling coil um, through 10 feet or more of duct. Otherwise, oh. there's no requirement for filtration of outdoor air. And we know that's totally inadequate in the Pacific Northwest now. Don't we have other proposals on that issue? Yes, later today we'll be considering a proposal about higher filtration levels. So if this whole intent of this proposal is around the requirement for the ERB, and perhaps Valerie was going to talk to that, um, Again, I thought the ERV requirements were in the energy code. They, they are as options. Uh, so on your air ceiling requirements in section, I believe it's section two off the top of my head, I don't have the document in front of me. Once you breach three air exchanges and start moving towards the additional credit requirements in the energy code, ERVs of varying uh, efficiency specifications are required to achieve those credits. So to jump in there a bit too, Nancy, they are required for R2 that has to comply with the commercial energy code. 
Um, but for R2 that is compliant with the residential energy code, that's what Jonathan was just speaking to, that for those types of units, those are credits available to be earned, but not mandated. Correct. And our current, me the mechanical code provisions don't require ERV for those, they just require a balance system. So you're just, you're being, you'd be able to design a balance system per the IMC rules or a balance system for this would introduce a balance system for that's designed per 62.2 2019 rules as an acceptable alternate. Uh, Valerie, go ahead. Yeah, if you um, can hear me, sorry, I am getting low, poor quality and transmission here on my volume, but to use ASHRAE 62.2, we would definitely have to make sure that the dwelling units are treated separately from the public corridors and other public spaces within a multifamily um, building. It, it wouldn't it would be, we'd have to go over to 62.2 to make sure all the requirements in there meet our standards that we have now. You're making that an exception so somebody can use 62.2 instead of any of the written 403.4. So I guess, Jonathan, the question there, has that review been done to do that? detailed comparison of 62.2 to what is presently required in the whole house ventilation section just to make sure the minimum requirements in Washington state code right now are also um, mandated by 62.2. I am not certain I'd have to check with the person who created the proposal. Cool, thanks. Uh, Mike, go ahead. I just wanted to say that the reason that H and ERVs are coming up here and as I understand it from what Jonathan was saying, the intention is to ensure that you can get an exemption here for, um, for, uh, for installing an H or ERV for the requirement is that the way the mechanical code reads right now, the literal reading of it, it does require in the mechanical code an H or ERV in all group two uh, dwelling units. So the action of the, of the tag was to change that language because of that um, misapplication or misreading um, to align with the intent. And I, as I understand it, like this, why Mike would write the exception here is he wants to avoid the text down below in the 2019 version that says you have to have an H or, e, H or E or B. And that text, if it said, um, if it said where required in the IECC commercial or the commercial energy code, an HRERV shall be provided, but it says as required, an HRV shall be provided. And that difference in the wording there um, indicates, and this is why it was changed, that an HRERV is required for all dwelling units. So that's why the, all the confusion around that. Right, well, there was something in here that Luby had put in called low rise and somebody had struck it out, I think in the last code proposal when we, when we discussed this, like, can we please remove that word low rise? And so now it reads differently, like we're trying to affect the whole mechanical code for commercial as well. And we're not worried about commercial. Commercial has nothing to do within our wheelhouse, actually. What we are worried about is specifically residential uh, multifamily properties that fall underneath Washington State's energy, residential energy code. Uh, issues with ERVs, not only the you know, implication and maintenance, but again, they are part of our um, credit selection process in the energy code. So you're, you're going to, it is part of the 406.3. And so as these buildings get more tight, um, ERVs are required. And I think the most ERVs have a MERV 8 in them anyways. Um, right? Most are now trying to move towards MERV 13s. You got Universal, you got, uh, what's the other guy that's awesome? Xanders, you got some really great guys out there that have these MERV 13s or new components that can be added on that are MERV 13s. Um, we were just specifically worried about the issues that were going to cause, and again, in, in residential properties, not commercial properties. And the language in there originally did have low-rise multifamily, but it was struck out in, in the meeting before this one or the last one or, or one, of those, one of the prior meetings. Yeah, just to hop in there, I think, Jonathan, that was a different proposal. Um, not oh, sorry, was it? I was muted. 62.2, oh. there was a different Mike Loveliner proposal where 
that topic was discussed. Um, Eric, okay. something to add there? No, it just sounds like we're ready for a motion, so. Um, Nancy. <laughs> well, maybe, um, I guess I'm still confused. I'm hearing different things and wondering if this language needs to be adjusted. I keep being told, I think I'm hearing, and you guys know I'm not the ME here, that um, what they're trying to accomplish could possibly done be done with a language proposal as opposed to a wholesale adoption of 622-2019. I believe the overall intent from Michael Lubliner, again, was to allow the energy credits to sort out the issues of ERVs and not forcing it for people to make those selections that as they started doing air sealing, uh, they'd be required to take these ERVs and then they would figure out the problems and then mandate it at a different time. Let, let the industry sort it out was, I mean, if you really want to boil it down to his biggest concerns of the whole thing was, is he doesn't want to be a guinea pig. He wants to wait for this to, to figure itself out um, with all of the proposals, not just the mechanical proposals that are currently happening in this code. There's a lot of changes happening to envelope and building pressures that are going on. And, and I, I can see his concern. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Eric. So, yeah, I think this proposal needs a lot of wordsmithing, a lot of help to, to figure out what it, what is it intended to cover. As we all know, the code official can, adapt, can approve alternate means and methods of crest for, for anything for an engineered system. So that already exists in chapter one of the mechanical code. I think this is a dangerous um, proposal to add is it's going to decrease enforceability and, and across the state. So I would recommend we stay with our um, more prescriptive code um, for residential ventilation. Um, this proposal isn't intended, in my opinion, to clarify what's happening in low rise residential. It's not written for low rise residential. If, if that was the intent, then we could wordsmith to to change that. But at this point, I think we need to move on to other things and we need to get a motion on the table with what the, the tag wants to do with this. So. Thanks, Eric. So I think then we are either looking for a motion to table so more work can be done or probably a motion for disapproval if um, this overall option is not um, desirable for the tag. I make a motion to not move this good um, proposal forward. Thanks, Valerie. Is there a second? So just to clarify the motion, the motion was to disapprove this proposal. Um, is there a second for that motion? I'll second. Okay. So uh, any further discussion? Okay, um, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. For those who are here, Krista, if that's possible. Okay. Nancy. I'm gonna abstain. I feel out of my depth on this one. So I, Krista, just so we're on the same page, a yes vote here would mean you're in agreement to disapprove. Valerie? Yes. Jonathan? No, thank you. <laughs> Chris? Yes. Andrea? No. Brandon? No.
Okay, motion fails. Two yes, three no, one abstention. Okay, so the motion to disapprove failed. Do so, um, you want a new motion? Yes. Okay, since it since it failed, it sounds like maybe there could be more work on it. So I'll move tabling in um, for the chance of one more attempt to wordsmith it. Thanks, Nancy. So there's a motion to table. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Andrea. All those in favor to, well, let's do a roll call vote on this one as well. Okay. Ah, sorry. Nancy. A yes. Valerie. No. Jonathan. Yes. Chris. Yes. Andrea. Yes. Brandon. Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Five to one. Okay. Um, so I think uh, that means for next week, Jonathan, perhaps you can um, communicate some of the requested edits to Mike so that the proposal can address the concerns and comments raised today. And we will again next week. Great. And then similar to um, the proposal we discussed prior to this, just making sure any revised versions are received by no later than end of day Tuesday so that all the TAG members have a chance to look at those. Awesome. Um, and so that I think applied to proposal eight and nine, both on the same topics. So let's go ahead and move on to proposal 77. So I think, Eric, this is your proposal, IMC section 401.4 about intake opening locations. Okay, thanks. Um, so I took the feedback from last week's meeting and I've narrowed down this to be, um, to respond to the comments we, we that I, that I received last week from the tag. Um, so I've decided to add based on the, the ASHRAE 62.1 language parking garage entries up above to highlight that the, the, I mean, folks are missing this on a lot of projects. The entry to the parking lot is, it's not a street, it's not an alley, it's just an entry to the parking lot that's on their property. So I think that is good language to add in from 62.1. And then I provided two exceptions to respond to comments last week. I've narrowed this down from 1000 CFM to 500 CFM. I limited this to group R occupancies only as requested. And then I provided two different conditions as we discussed. One is uh, a length limitation that decreases, um, you know, from the 25 feet above the parking lot to, to 15 feet above a parking lot, uh, based on the ASHRAE standard being five feet from the anticipated tailpipe location. So I've, I've said that the tailpipe is, you know, typically going to be around 10 feet off the ground in an average parking garage or parking space, surface parking space. Um, you know, we're not talking about a, a truck on an alley that's that's idling. We're talking about a parking space. So, um, so that's a very conservative distance, 10 feet plus than the five foot that separation um, from, from that. So 15 feet above the parking lot would be acceptable if you can't maintain the 10 foot horizontal to the parking lot. And then exception two is for uh, the parking garage entry only. So we're not talking about the street or the alley or a loading dock. We're talking about the parking garage entry that you can decrease to, and I, I chose 15 feet above the clear height for the vehicle entering the parking garage. So 
Um, again, there's not necessarily high traffic as much on the street, but there could be idling cars at the parking garage entry. So uh, in this case, most parking garages have somewhere around an, you know, an eight foot two requirement for accessible uh, vans and a, a seven foot six requirement for clear entry into the parking garage. Um, so we'd be going 15 feet above that design distance. So it would allow you to reduce um, it a few feet, but not, uh, you know, so you may be talking 22 feet or something above uh, the, the surface. So that's, that's what I came up with based on the discussion last week. I'm open to, to modifying the distances, but that's kind of what I heard is the concern is that we did not want to apply this to streets and alleys and wanted to limit it to just group our occupancies. Um, so that's what I came up with. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for all your work on this for sure. Um, questions from the tag or anyone else on Eric's changes here? Uh, Valerie. Um, number one is still reading incorrectly. Krista, can you delete that last sentence in the, under number one? Up well, Krista, I think you looked up that up and that is part of the Washington State Code. It's just not part of the model code. Is that correct? Yes, this is definitely part of the Washington State Code. I did put it back in. Hmm. Not in my code. Interesting. All right. Any other questions or thoughts for Eric? If not, I think we are looking for a motion on this one. Yeah, I'll move to approve. Thanks, Brandon. Is there a second? I'll second. Thanks, Nancy. Any further discussion? All right, if not, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. All right, motion carries. So that brings us to proposal 76, which is dealing with the clarifications for distributed, not distributed. I think, Eric, this proposal is also yours if you want to refresh everybody on the proposal and any of the changes that have been made since last time. Okay, just as a quick refresher, this is an attempt to maintain status quo with what we've been doing. At and how the, the code is currently written for Washington. It's not meant to change things substantially. Um, as we know, in the 2018 code cycle, we rewrote the, the ventilation code for the state. And so this is bringing back the, the, the clearer uh, interior adjoining space language that was part of the 2015 code. Um, it's responding uh, to the interpretation uh, that each uh, habitable space needs ventilation, except with uh, some specific exceptions as we walked through last time, we're adding these definitions for interior adjacent room and interior adjoining space to improve the clarity of the code. There's been a request from city of Seattle and some other jurisdictions to have a clear definition for balanced uh, versus not balanced and distributed versus not distributed. So we can clearly uh, point to those definitions. So um, 
But so the specific changes that I made for last week is that when we went through it, we noticed that I had left out, um, I think it's in the yellow highlight that's further down. Uh, so I had inadvertently left out this, the, the sentence about um, the CFM of the transfer fan and then uh, the, the, uh, the sewn rating and control requirements of those. So I added those two sentences back in for uh, the transfer fan and the relief air um, inlet option for ventilating the interior adjacent room has new um, for the new definition that we have there. So then we scroll down to the next section that same language is repeated here um, so that we have it covered for both, uh, both different types of R2 versus the non R2. And then as discussed last time, um, I'm, I'm open to removing the reference further on where we talk about the velocities that this, if uh, to match whatever language we come up with in uh, C401 for that. I guess we did pass adding that language to C401 last time. So I guess I'd propose keeping it here. So again, that's um, the changes that were made from last week. I guess I also struck through that exception to there that was no longer needed when I moved that language up to the, uh, the appropriate section above. So, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, any questions or comments for Eric on this one? Uh, Mike, go ahead. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, Eric, I sent you an email about this, but I have concerns there related to the, uh, the requirement in number two there, that second exception about the outdoor, uh, the exhaust air concentration within the, in the outdoor air intake airflow does not exceed 10% and requiring that the manufacturer demonstrate that. I mean, it's, you know, a hyper aggressive code official reading this could say that uh, the manufacturer needs to come out to the site and show me, you know, that the exhaust air is not more than uh, or the exhaust air concentration is not more than 10% of the outdoor air intake airflow. So it could be construed as an in situ test. Um, there's no standard to reference here. So manufacturers can just say, yeah, we've done our own testing, I guess. And, and um, you're good to go just via an email. And um, maybe that counts or uh, maybe they, uh, the code official requires um, special demonstration of this through an approved laboratory or you know, something I think it's just way open ended and difficult and and the IMC to, to demonstrate that IMC and IRC have moved forward each with uh, with not requiring demonstration of this based on test results that have indicated that um, that they're likely to be less than 10 percent and um, and so they don't require any more any additional testing at this point in the model code um, where before these fittings had to be approved, there's no longer a special approval process. It's just, it just has to be a uh, factory built combined intake exhaust termination fitting. Yeah, I'm totally fine with removing that section, that sentence from- I shouldn't have been so long-winded then. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And then we probably, so the end, it would be there's it's repeated down below under supply fans also, so we could remove it from there. Thanks, Mike. And did you have any other specific comments for this one? Um, I had some concerns about it being perhaps too restrictive about where the outdoor air could be brought in. For example, if you've got a living room right next to a dining room, um, the way that I read this before is that you could provide the outdoor air to the uh, living room, the, the, the room with the exterior windows, but not to the room without the exterior windows um, if you're using that air to ventilate both spaces. 
and using that transfer fan option. And I just thought that was a little too restrictive to say that if you know they're in communication with each other through this transfer fan, what do we care if you dump it into room A or room B? Um, or what do we care if there's a window in room A or room B when really we're talking about mechanical ventilation here and, and getting it to both rooms and that should be the main objective. And so I thought that the way it was written, it was restrictive and that it would say, you can dump to the room with a window, but if it doesn't have a window, you can't, you can't dump to that and then bring it to the other room. And I don't see how that really applies here. So I don't know, Eric, if you're able to change the window to, or the, change the definitions to address that situation, but that was another concern of mine. Well, yeah, we did discuss this when you weren't on the call last week. Um, as I stated, this proposal is to maintain status quo is what we have, but have clear language. So that's the way it's been for several code cycles in Washington state is that the, the exterior rooms have to receive the ventilation and that only the interior spaces um, have been able, have had alternates that don't have to have to be directly ventilated. So yeah, again, I think that's a separate code proposal. Um, there was voice of concern again last week from Nancy at Department of Health the, that, you know, should all rooms just have to be ventilated. Um, but again, this is meant to be a status quo proposal that that maintains what we currently have and doesn't make it less or more restrictive, just more clear. So well and what we currently have is a requirement related to natural ventilation that you have to um, <clears throat> ventilate an interior room from a naturally ventilated exterior room. And the only way to you know naturally ventilate would be through windows, of course. So it's naturally going to be but that, uh, that's not how our code's been written, no. It's a, we've used that interior adjoining space language for since I think the 2012 code and have options for transfer fans and the permanent opening um, for the interior space. But the exterior rooms always required either trickle vents or in the four. The, so we had four different methods of ventilation under the you know 2015 and before, um, which were trickle vents whole house ERV, whole house supply fan, or whole house integrated furnace, and all those required the, the exterior rooms to have ventilation delivered directly to the exterior spaces. But help me understand why, because if the interior I, rooms are no going to why get... to it. There's no why to it. It's just how... Let's just keep doing it. it. <laughs> okay. So again, somebody needs to propose a proposal that's not status quo, I guess. And at this point, we don't have one for this code cycle. It, it seems to me that you want to get the ventilation to the interior rooms more than the exterior because the exterior are naturally going to be ventilated more because they are they're next to where the openings are or the uh, you know penetrations. And so your infiltration is going to happen there first. And interior you're going to have less air changes. So if anything, I, I guess I think them. of it the opposite way that yeah. The, you want it at the exterior because most of your exhausted spaces are on the interior. So you're going to be drawing back that air towards your bathroom, which is typically your ERV exhaust location. Hmm. Or maybe it just doesn't really matter. Um, as long yeah, as I mean, it's most distributed. of the units are so small that it, they, <laughs> that it doesn't matter a lot in the multifamily. So. Um, Austin, go ahead. Just a quick comment on that last part. Um, most of the contaminants are coming from outside air. Uh, so putting more supply air in exterior space can actually help reduce some infiltration of, you know, uh, harmful VOCs or what have you, smoke infiltration, things like that. So uh, it can improve indoor air quality. But your supply air is outdoor air. But that's filtered. Filtered now at least. Filtered, yeah. Which won't address the VOCs, but yeah, it would be an improvement over your uh, particulate matter concentration. Okay. Uh, Nancy. Sorry, um, you all have this habit of getting me kind of confused. Um, 
I wanted my original concern, um, besides the discussion that just went on, which apparently we can't do much about right now, although as you might remember from last week, I'm horrified at the idea of bedrooms without windows. Um, That's a building code issue though. So you gotta go fix that in the building code. Yeah, it's still <laughs> horrifying to me. But the sentence that you just eliminated up there, um, oh, I'm trying to scroll on Krista's screen, sorry. Um, the one you eliminated that referred to the, the, the 10%, I couldn't tell when you eliminated that reference because you didn't want an overzealous code official requiring on-site testing. Is it still requiring that it not exceed 10% mixing? So we added that statement back in section 401 to be more restrictive. Um, that's what the tag decides do. So I think we can remove that statement being redundant here. Um, Michael's more, more, Mike Moore's point still um, from last week's meeting when we when we passed that was that you know there there isn't a testing standard. Some code official could read this and require that. Um, it sounds like you know IMC and ASHRAE 62 have moved away from. They're going to be removing that language for the 10% recirculation. Um, in well, the, I guess my in the next version, but yes, we are. We we did provide a pointer to that in section 401 last week. So, okay, because I certainly don't want it to exceed 10%. I mean, I'd rather be closer to zero. Um, so that was my concern. So you're you're saying it already says in 401 that it can't exceed 10 percent yeah we're, we're um from a model code perspective nancy there's there's no requirement for these because there's no evidence that it uh that it does exceed 10 percent so um the the thinking was why why introduce a new requirement here for this this testing when there's no evidence um from the tests that have been conducted that 10 percent is is exceeded at any time Okay, I understand that part of it. What I what I want to make sure is that we're not leaving a loophole to begin exceeding it um, with the language. So the language that would allow you to use these terminations is in 4014. So that is the better location for, for this. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, Austin, did you have another comment? Nope, just lowering my hand. Thanks. All right. Um, any more questions or proposed modifications on this one? All right, hearing none, I think we are looking for a motion on one, which is, as Eric stated, intended to be clarification, um, not intended to change rigor. Would anyone like to make a motion? I guess I'm confused. I don't generally make motions on areas outside my expertise, but why is there so much hesitancy if you've all agreed? It sounded like from the discussion that this was clarifying. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Nancy. I think Eric put a lot of effort and time into consulting with a bunch of folks to try to clarify the requirements for balance, not balance, distributed, not distributed. So. I think it's adding some good rigor to the code for sure. 
Yeah, I'm still perusing and making sure that there's been no significant changes to other stuff that was trickling out. Um, I actually, I'll make a motion to approve it as written. Thanks, Jonathan. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Nancy. Any further discussion? All right, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. All right, motion passes. So we've got about 15 minutes left today. Um, I guess we should probably stick with the previously approved agenda. So Mike Fowler, are you still on here? Did Mike drop off? Yes, no, I'm, I'm on. Oh, you're here. Just, just switching on the camera and unmuting. Excellent. Well, I'm not quite sure we'll get all the way through this one today, but maybe you just want to give us an update on some of the latest options. Yeah, I'll try to give you as concise an update as I can. Uh, there, Right now, there are two options, but I'm going to try to make this go back to just an option A here. Uh, what this has is a lot of input from Eric Randomay and um, I think we're in a near 100% agreement on that. Uh, what it does is establishes a specific MERV uh, filtration based on occupancies. Uh, and it focuses MERV 13 on where there are the highest uh, density occupancies. Uh, it also does a little bit of tweaking to the edit or edits the language uh, from 605.5 uh, that was previously approved from the tag. Uh, so it, it just, there were some slight modifications of that language. Um, where option B was, is I was still trying to figure out if does it tackle recirculated air enough. Um, what I would like to do is um, put 6051 up into option A uh, from option B, uh, because that language I've, is being taken from California. So I don't know, Chris, do it. yeah, thank you. Because in that one there there was not any edits, but yes. Um, and then the only the other piece I would want to add is that in that second sentence, right after the first line, where it has an, with approved air filters, filters, um, and then I just would like to say meeting six hundred five point four. So at the top line where there's filters dot filters, after that second filters, say meeting six hundred five point four. And, my, and I'll say the reason I was doing that is just because as a non-mechanical engineer reading it, it, to me, it seemed like heating and air conditioning systems, or at least heating systems could do whatever they want in terms of filtration, whereas cooling coils in 605.4 had these um, filtration requirements. So I was just trying to make sure it's applicable to all heating and cooling systems. So that's where I think just try to focus the tag's attention on this because it retains 95% um, of what Eric proposed, uh, which is I'm um, in agreement with. And the other, other topic I would like you to discuss is uh, within that BERF 13 groups, uh, should group R be included or not? So that's the a quick update. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. So just for clarification, just hoping the tag can can consider option A and not option B. Correct, yes. Great, um, so. go ahead. With I'll where, say. I'll say where we were agreement, option A is fundamentally everything Eric proposed, which I was on board with. Uh, my tweak is just uh, that 6051. So that's just so that's clear. Eric, you were about to say something, I'm sorry. Sorry, I thought of it. Oh, I had the floor, but yeah, never mind. But yeah, what I would say is I'm I'm in favor of option A because it works within the framework of our code. I'm totally open to figuring out the right type of level of filtration that we want for each uh, category. I mean, since I was able to review this last week, I have looked at several. Uh, you know, I've looked at the California code in more detail. That's requiring you know MERV 13 everywhere. So maybe. 
maybe we want to do that um, if, if that's where we want to go. But I, I think this framework to work in is much better. Um, I did research one, you know, the, the, uh, the Epica uh, high efficiency PTHP for residential, they do now have a MERV 13 option at that recirculating um, fan coil, but, you know, they're one of the few manufacturers I know that have a MERV 13 option for recirculating equipment for small residential type applications. You know, all the VRF mini splits that are using wall consoles, um, you know, those are MERV 4 filters. Nobody, nobody has an option yet, as far as I know, to go above uh, a, a washable um, MERV 4 filter. So that item three, you know, we definitely need to talk about uh, where we could use that and, and probably provide more limitations on what I originally proposed there um for the unducted air handler uh type category um and then i guess this is it is clear that yeah this so the the way i read that and i guess going back to the first section 605.1 I, I like the edits up there i guess you're what you're trying to say is recirculated air and outdoor supplied to occupiable spaces so the occupiable space is intended to to be both for recirculated and for the outdoor air. Is it or is that how folks are reading that? Um, I, I, you know, unoccupied electrical rooms and things like that. I don't, I don't see a need to have high levels of filtration. You know, the the unducted wall consoles consoles are are a great application for energy efficiency in unoccupied spaces so i want to make sure that however we write this that we don't that we don't somehow interpret that recirculated that that all recirculated air <laughs> systems have to have a, a higher level of filtration so so i think we're close but i don't know if we're quite there but i would rather focus on option a than b yeah and i'm, I'm agreeing with you eric <laughs> Yeah, I have some questions too about just 605.4 requiring it upstream of cooling coils. And then, Mike, it sounds like you're trying to fix that by referencing it in 605.1, but it, it still seems like just a touch vague there. So I think that could use a little bit of work. I guess my other question is this proposal initially started out kind of focused on the smoke filtration capability. So just curious if the cost data has been updated um, in the lower half of the proposal. It was the smoke piece from 6055, uh, but the, where this tangented it off was uh, the exception that did, did not or exempted to recyc recirculated air, uh, which is where this tangent went to with this proposal. Yeah, so I guess my and right now the focus uh, to answer your question, Caroline, is the yeah. focus has been on getting the language correct first. Okay. Because I think just given that level of change, that some additional detail on the cost side will probably be needed at some point. So, um, Nancy, go ahead. I was just going to say um, there is huge interest both on both of these issues, um, <clears throat> and I probably stated that last week for the interior circulation where appropriate it's respiratory virus control um, that research is really solid now and there's interest from the governor's office on down that we provide better filtration and ventilation to control respiratory diseases and then for the external air it's it's wildfire smoke but it's also areas um, with poor vent, um, outdoor air because of traffic related air pollutants the airports um, wood burning um, etc so you know it's a number of years now that we've been recommending that outside air go through a MERV 13 filter it's become standard in any of the EPA literature 
um, and supported by the research. So I really appreciate the work being done on this. I, my agency is very excited to see this happening, which is why they've asked for the procedures to support it if it passes us. Thanks, Nancy. Um, Valerie, go ahead. Yeah, in, in the requirements where you pick your group occupancies, I do agree you need to have an R in there because you're excluded R. You've excluded a couple different occupancies and I guess that's on purpose. But if you want to include residential units, then you'll need to put that in there somewhere. It was not in the list that Eric had put together first. That's my only, uh, that is my interest area area as well as that, that maybe group R is also applicable to that, that, that MRF 13 filtration level uh, for the exact same reasons that Nancy just described um, in take air for anybody who's in you know, winter winter wood, wood smoke uh, in addition to summer wildfire, but also uh, anything that's in a high traffic area near freeways where you know, PM 2.5 is a concern as well. So have you checked if the small ERVs can handle a MERV 13? Uh, my understanding is many of them can, yes. It was, it was that's part of a topic that was on the last piece with uh, um, the Mike Lubliner proposal. Yeah, I checked a few, but most of them do R8, I mean MERV 8, and MERV 13 is an extra expense on us. So you can get them, but they're much more expensive. It in increases your fan, increases that pressure process systems. That's a good synopsis, Valerie. This is Mike Moore. And um, yeah, MERV-8 is pretty typical for your entry level, let's say, HRERV. MERV-13, and, and that's often washable. Um, you get up to MERV-13 and you're definitely uh, dealing with a replacement filter that, um, that would add costs. Um, California does require MERV-13 uh, for residential HERVs this point but um so there are you know a lot of models out there that, that do provide those but yes there are additional costs thanks mike it's helpful any other feedback or comments or questions for mike as he potentially takes one more pass at this in the next couple of days. Oh. Um, Eric, go ahead. So yeah, I guess it is, if we wanna add group R to item one of there, then we may wanna consider some sort of exception for you know, unducted recirculating fan coils that are under a small CFM or something just to be more affordable. But I don't know, that's that's kind of where the, the products are coming along to respond. But, um, you know, that's that's really the, uh, the, the key thing we need to decide on, so. <clears throat> and part of this with, the code going to affect July next year for new permit applications, getting through the process and then getting construction. You're probably looking at spring of 25 when, you know, so there's a, I don't know, say an 18 month window or more from now uh, where manufacturers can see that's coming in, let's say to Washington, that products are selling in California, they can now market in Washington state. But yeah, you, we definitely have to do something about item three. If, if you want to pick mm -hmm. up yeah. residential. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I, would, I would give a little caution to this. Uh, we are struggling in the residential properties to get ERVs in. Those who take the air tightness um, credits uh, do, do put these in and they're looking for cost effective solutions to it. And right now, the most cost effective ERVs um, are in the, the eight section. So my question to this is, um, would that be counted as far as for, for ducted air handlers surface and other than a group, you know, so um, that seems like it's written in R, right? Like Mervate for ducted air handlers surface and other 
then group Zs would have an M4 filtration or M8, right? So this seems like this is already kind of covered here for, for the R groups. It says all other. But anyways, where I'm going is also be, be cautious that the, the most commonly used ERV right now that the, I believe the Housing Authority of King County did a study on and had great results with, uh, I don't want to be product you know, branding or nothing like that. So I'm not going to go there, but it is one of the lower cost units. And I'm always about what works one years, two years, three years, 10 years down the road. And, and that one has seen some of the best successes um, other than some of the high end, more Cadillac type units. You, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just, I'm just be cautious about the ERV one uh, going above eight um, only because you're going to push them into um, the systems that are not typically being installed now. Like they're, they're low rent cost units right now, and, and they are struggling with that cost. We hear it a lot on the technical code support. And so I'd caution maybe um, with the exception of ERVs, because MERV 13 filters for air handler units is, is, as Nancy has said, has been a standard for Energy Star for quite some time and has, been, has, has great market penetration in residential properties. Um, I'm just cautioning against using single, because you know most R2s as nations, because the way things are set up, we're not using shared units, right? We're using individual units. And so, that's, that's my word of caution. I would just be a little bit cautious about what ERVs you end up excluding through this process on the low end that's being used the most. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, Eric, final comment of the day here. I mean, this still excludes 500 CFM or less for the, the outdoor air, so the small ERVs aren't getting picked up yet. Yeah, perfect. perfect. All right, um, Mike, did you get enough feedback there to work with maybe to bring this back for next week? Yeah, if Eric's got, I would like to interact with MS if that's just his availability, say Tuesday. Because <laughs> um, I'm in the energy code tag all day tomorrow. <laughs> that leaves Tuesday. So I just make it if that, I guess, how close do you think we are, Eric? Uh, you wanted to add something. I think you're, wait. Your point was well, to address light, light on pick, three and MER four. And the what I hear is people want to pick up group R for MER 13, but maybe we still have some sort of exception. I don't know. So we can play with pulling in and out that exception. So. Uh, Valerie, go ahead. Yeah, the number two, the MER eight, when it says other than group A, B, E, M, it just, that's a laundry list. So it's not saying all other groups. If you put all other groups in there, that would include the R, but it's a laundry list, so that's all you get included in that. If it's if you remove that and just say serving other than other groups, oh. yeah, okay. you could get the R in the eight that way. It's better than it was in the last code section. Last code. Yeah, I, I agree. That's the assumption. Is that right now, as written? Or, uh, group R is in MERV 8. Um, so one final comment. Is it helpful to extend my draconian deadline to noon on Wednesday for everybody? That way people still have Wednesday afternoon and the early risers have Thursday morning to look at items. Is that a helpful change? It's acceptable for me. I love the descriptor words you used. <laughs> All right. Let's go with that. And I will um, reach out to each proponent. So everybody who, for the proposals we haven't gotten to yet, everybody's aware that noon, noon deadline. So tag members have time to review them before next Thursday's meeting. Um, so next, next meeting, we're going to need someone that's ready to make motions. We can get through this. <laughs> well, uh, still warming up. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the expertise that has been brought to the table, all the thoughtful comments. Um, so thank you all. Uh, we are adjourned. We will see everybody next week. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.